All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this Historicon session. This is our final John Company related session of the convention. And we have been having demos and I did a bit of a development chat. Um, I'm recording this today because this will all be on the Really Gig YouTube channel at some point in the near future. Uh, and I want to make sure that we're capturing this um, for posterity. Now, in this session, um, I'm going to be sometimes addressing two groups in the Discord um, who are at the Discord for this online game convention. And if folks in the Discord have questions, um, they should put them in the channel chat, and I will try to work them into this uh, to this overview as best I can. We have actually have a question um, right away that I will be getting to uh, as I go through it. So basically, here's how I'm going to structure this chat. So um, first, let me just say a word about uh, where, where the game is. What you're looking at is a teach for a very near final um, uh, version of John Company 2nd Edition. Uh, the game is currently going through uh, the stages of design lock as we finalize the text on things and we take things through the last stage of layout. Um, the game will be basically completely done within about a month. Uh, I'm not anticipating any other large rules changes. Mostly we're just adjusting, uh, wording, num a few small numbers, things like that. So this teach should be good for quite a long time. Eventually, uh, Drew and I will be replacing it with either a more polished teach, which we'll offer, or uh, maybe even something professional. Uh, but who knows? Uh, so I'm hoping that I do well enough in this video that it's worth kicking around for a long time. Um, now. The way I'm going to structure this teach is that first I'm going to offer a general, it's going to have several sections which we can probably flag in the YouTube video, but f firstly I'm going to offer um, some general remarks and then also talk about the theme, the overview, the components, the kind of like general introduction that if you already know the game you could ask people in your playgroup to just watch the first 10 or 20 minutes of the video and that will really bring them uh, up to speed. The next section of the video is going to be an extensive teach of almost every element of play. We will go through the phases one by one. I will talk about all the actions available to the players, and I will offer some examples, although I will try to keep the examples uh, somewhat min minimal, and I will try to offer a little bit of historic commentary, but again, keeping that to a minimum just so we don't run too long. In the third section, I'm going to be talking about um, phases that I might have skipped in that second section. Uh, the biggest one is the events in India phase, which I'll just kind of gesture at, but I will then uh, talk through all the uh, rules of the events in India, which are not uh, too complicated, but you know, I was a teacher for a long time, and I know that we get to certain limits where when you've been listening for half an hour or 40 minutes, and things might start kind of falling off. And so I, I want to just separate some of the, the more technical elements for that third section. And then in the fourth section, I'll say a couple words about the general scenario structure of the game and how the private firms work and, and talk through hopefully some examples of those. Uh, now, uh, one person in the chat has already brought up what is, I think, a question that I'm going to be getting a lot, and it's a very good question, which is, uh, does this edition work better with a full teach rather than the teach by diving in approach recommended by the first edition. So with several of the larger games I've worked on, I usually encourage players to just start playing and to treat their first game as a kind of like sandbox, a, a total play thing, uh, just so they can get a sense of how the systems work. I recommend this approach because the games are huge, and I think it's easy to uh, get bogged down and it's uh, and it's better just to start playing them. Now that approach will still work with this version of the game but one thing that I've learned uh, in, in, in the years since the first edition was published um, is that really there's a huge diversity in how to learn games and you might have a, the type of game group that wants to learn things in an extended full teach and so an example of that that I see pretty commonly is someone will bring this game to a game night and say Next week, I really want to play John Company. I don't want to play it this week, but after we're done with our regular games, if y'all want me to do a walkthrough, we can walk through. And then after the regular game night, they'll do a kind of one-turn walkthrough. And then the next week, they can give a kind of Cliff Notes version of that talk, or of, of that teach, and then jump right in. Uh, Drew and I are actually experiencing this question right now firsthand, because we have a very small uh, friends game convention coming up. And we debated um, asking our friends to like watch this video or read the rules or something because we really want to play John Company with them, but we don't really want to play it a first game of John Company with them. So this is a real question for everyone. Uh, and I think, again, it's just going to depend on your game group. <clears throat> okay, so 
let's start with the first part of the teach. So uh, John Company is a negotiation game for one to six players that covers the rise and collapse of the East India Company. Now the East, Company, East India Company is a little bit older than the game's start time, but for all intents and purposes, it covers about 150 years, going from about 1710 to 1857 or just beyond. Uh, now, during this time, the East India Company was a state-sanctioned monopoly. Uh, what that means is that it was uh, chartered by the state and uh, protected by the, the state to handle all trade between India and other parts of the world back to England. Um, and this was a huge operation, and uh, a lot of these state chartered companies were the prototypes for today's transnational corporations, for today's... Um, uh, you know, just large like joint stock companies and things like that. We're, we're, we're looking at the very origins of those systems. Now, uh, the way this game tells the story, though, is by atomizing the East India Company. So instead of there being one player who's playing the East India Company, and if this were like a root faction, that's how we'd do it. Instead of there being just one player, all of the players collectively form the East India Company. We all jockey to control it. And at the bottom of the board here, you can see this big ribbon. And the ribbon uh, has these portraits, which are the player pieces. These are your family members. And next to them, there is the title. And so you can see this as a kind of like flat organizational chart of the company. And over a player's uh, career, they might have a character who's a writer sitting here in this writer's box. Writers are like low-level clerks. They might get promoted to this position here, the president of Bengal. And then you know, rise through the, the company to various positions before eventually re retiring to one of these fabulous estates, which are called prizes. Now, the estates here have a victory point value. Um, and so every piece in this estate is going to be worth this many victory points. And eight victory points in this game is a lot. Oftentimes, a winning score is like 20. Uh, and in fact, sometimes a winning score is like two. Uh, so you have to watch out for that. Some, so, sometimes they're quite a low scoring game. Now, this design um, is really about empire and about colonialism, and it's choosing to tell the story from the perspective of the British, um, not because that isn't a story that gets told, but it's because it's a story that often gets told very badly. And so the, the British are not imagined here necessarily as arch villains. Instead, uh, what we're looking at is the banality of evil. This is... Um, Understanding empire as something that was done um, in concert with a lot of different interests and peoples across a huge amount of time and space. Uh, and you can see how all of those, those things coalesce into the creation of, of the British Empire uh, towards the end of the game. Uh, but when the game starts, the British Empire is not hardly an empire at all. Um, although some historians might class it as such. Uh, we are all families that have looked at the East India Company as a way to become socially mobile. And so this is also a game about social mobility, about the London season, about what it meant to be respectable and prestigious in the 1760s and the 1780s and the 1830s, and indeed the ways in which what it meant to be respectable changed over the course of that period, sometimes called like the long 18th century. Um, okay, so that's, that's my historic preamble. Now, what I want to do uh, before we jump into the mechanics of the game is just acquaint you a little bit with some of the pieces. So we've already talked about a player's family members, and every player has 18 of these family members. Each one will have a different portrait on it, but the portraits are wholly cosmetic. Um, and these represent your family's influence, uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll exist on the board in lots of different ways. Uh, and you, you, these are your most valuable resources. Uh, players also have a treasury of pounds. Um, each pound re represents uh, probably a thousand pounds or even more, uh, although it's it's a purposely vague um, <clears throat> marker for reasons I could I could talk about for, for a long time. Uh, but, but players have uh, a reserve of cash which they're going to be using to do various things. Um, every player position uh, that is an office will be associated with a card. So here in Blue's player area. You see that they uh, have the president of Bengal. That card right here is a kind of play aid that tells you what this piece can do. So every single office in the game is linked to one of these cards. 
Uh, players also have a player board, which will have lots of handy information about how to play the game on it, and will include um, a couple of small gameplay elements, namely their action selection menu and this little pensioner's box. Um, lastly, uh, players have an associate, uh, a number of little markers, which are going to be used for a few different things, and then they have a stack of promise cards. These promise cards are basically contracts that you can give to other players. You know, uh, this is a negotiation game and you're going to be making a lot of deals, but sometimes you don't have any money <laughs> to give people. You have nothing to offer. And so this is a way that you can offer things that you might not have yet. So you can say, hey, I don't have any money now, but at some point you're welcome to take two pounds from me. Or you could take the, the bonus my office holder might make. Or you could vote. Uh, you know, you could have my political power in some future election. Uh, these promises are a way of you essentially like going into a kind of negotiation debt uh, with, with different kinds of favors. Now let's take a look at the board. Um, the board is the central element of play in John Company. Uh, it serves as a giant play aid that will hold your hand through all of the phases in the game. Now up here in the top left, so I'm just going to kind of go through it in sections. Uh, up here in the top left, you have the victory point track. Uh, note that it does go into the negatives. Uh, and this track is infinite. If you pass the 20 mark, uh, you can put another victory point piece on it, or in the actual game, there'll be a plus 20 side, and you can you know, continue tracking your victory points. Now, on the left are the game's five prizes. These are your primary ways of uh, scoring victory points. So remember, your little family members are eventually, hopefully, going to be ending at, at these prizes. Now every prize has a few characteristics, and these characteristics are correspond to each piece in there. So if yellow, for instance, has two pieces in this prize, uh, that's 16 victory points, which is to say 8 times 2. Now in addition to victory points, prizes also have a number of windows. Uh, this represents tax liability. And the reason windows represent tax liability um, is because historically it was very difficult to assess uh, the value of a person's fortune uh, for tax purposes in a world where people weren't reporting their earnings on an annual level. So in order to assess tax value, tax collectors, the period covered this game, would count the number of windows you had in your house. The idea being that the richer families can afford to maintain more windows and certainly can maintain to heat a house that has more windows. So yeah, here we have our tax liability. In the uh, top left, we have the price of scoring that prize. So this prize costs 14 pounds to score. And then next to it, in the smaller circle, is the price to maintain. Every turn, you'll need to pay an additional three pounds just to keep your piece there. That means if you have two pieces here, you'll need to pay six pounds a turn to just keep these pieces there. If you cannot pay that money, this piece is lost. And by lost, I just mean return to the supply. OK, so that's the first section of the board. Uh, you'll also see, as it relates to scoring, that we have a little in-game scoring box. I'll be talking more about scoring later on. Um, but just know that like all the information you need to know about scoring is right there. Now, in the middle of the board, we have a variety of tracks and boxes and things. And these do a number of different things, um, including showing political status of the different uh, enterprises in the game. Uh, the relative health of the company, which is measured by its standing, which you want high, and its debt, which you want low. Uh, these spaces with uh, lines in them represent trouble. <laughs> so you generally don't want these pieces in these lines. It means that the company's uh, position is a little weak, and that can influence certain elements of play. Uh, now over here on the standing track, you'll notice that we have this scary black F. Uh, what this means is that if the standing of the company ever falls to the F, the company fails, and the game is over. Now, w when that happens, um, a lot of people are going to lose a lot of victory points. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but know that this is a chaotic event. There will still be a winner of, to the game. There's always a winner assessed, no matter what happens. Um, but the game can end prematurely if the company standing ever the fail. Now, the way the company standing moves, those things are described here, and we'll be talking about these movement shifts throughout the teach, but just know they are all there. Now, in the middle of the board, we have the London season display. Uh, this is how you're going to be competing with retirements and what you're fighting for. So when, when your people re re retire, you basically make shows of wealth and you go out to party and show how sophisticated you are in hope of drafting these cards. Um, no matter the player count, there's always only three available per turn. Uh, so sometimes you don't. You don't. 
Uh, there are many different types of cards. I'll draw your attention to three different types here. Uh, on the right, we have a spouse. Spouses uh, represent marriages into influential families. Uh, they're worth victory points, as indicated on the top right. They also have an important restriction that they uh, give the player. And this is to represent the fact that as a family, uh, as players make alliances with other more respectful families, they're going to have to deal with certain constrictions on the future identity of the player position. Now, some cards have a little banner in the top right, and these are called enterprises. This is a social enterprise. You can see that with the top hat. And the Rotten Borough, which represents um, a corrupt and easily manipulated uh, parliamentary district uh, is worth three votes, so, and they all have different effects that are listed on the bottom. Finally, uh, we have blackmail cards, which in the London season are face down, and when players have a chance to draw one of these cards, they're allowed to peek at this blackmail card, uh, and they can choose to take it or not take it. Uh, so sometimes these are, um, are rumors that are known or not known uh, by different players. Most of these cards are single-time effects. Uh, and several of them will provide players with a resource called power, which you can see it with that two icon in the bottom left. So power is a resource players can gather uh, in a number of different ways. And at the end of the game, players are awarded victory points for having the most power or the second most power. You get power by uh, getting blackmail cards and using them or not using or just holding them. Um, you can also get power from your enterprises. Now this I remember might remember I said it was a social enterprise and the status of social enterprises is currently very high every social enterprise is worth two power uh, throughout the game these things might change in their position so maybe company shares are worth two power and social enterprises are only worth one at the, at the point of the start of the game both workshops and shipyards are only worth one power each uh, the value of the power award is listed here uh, and it depends on the turn uh, that the game ends on the first three turns of the game Power is worth three to the victor and one to the second place. Second, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth turn, five and two, seven and eighth turn, eight and four. Uh, if there are ties, the tied players take the lower prize, which means if there's a tie for second, uh, those second player ties don't get anything. Um, okay, so that's what's going on kind of in the center of the board. We also have armies. Um, the thing you need to know about armies is that these they have pieces in them that can be exhausted to take various actions. Uh, and they also have commanders, which sit in this little slot here. So the Army of Bombay is captained by Green right now. Um, there's a box here where we're going to be storing vacant offices as well. We'll talk about that later. So the third element of the map uh, of the board is this very large map of India. Now what's going on with here? Well, lots of things are going on with this map. Um, the, I really just want to draw your attention to a couple different elements of the map, and then we can talk about it in further detail later. Um, one, um, the, you'll note uh, that India has an, a lot of these circles on them. These circles represent uh, commodities. They're, they're orders, um, and they might be different types of calicos or spices or gems or all sorts of things. Um, and in fact, Drew and I are having a conversation right now about whether or not we should put in very small text the, the different goods that would have been exported from these different regions. Um, but basically, uh, every order generates the company some amount of money, and the amount of money you generate depends on the number in the big circle. Don't worry about the small circle for now. Some orders are closed for trade. That basically means there's some kind of hostility towards trading to the company that would prevent um, any kind of transaction from happening. It could be uh, internal turmoil, or it could just be an anti-British attitude. A reasonable thing to have, of course. Uh, you'll also note that the regions have these towers. Any place you see uh, a, 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 a tower um, a, with, with no flag or with a big flag with a star, that's a sovereign region. So these are little sovereign states. They have their own political identities and wills. And then if you see a place with a big flag, and this is not super clear on the TTS. Let me see if I can. There it is. There, there's a star. Um, you can see it right here. So the stars are capitals. In this case, we're looking at the old Mughal Empire up here. And the smaller flags uh, are the, the dependent states of that empire. So you can see that these three gold regions are the Mughal Empire, or the remnants of it. And then we have a number of independent states. Um, these, this height of the tower represents the strength of the state. 
Um, so right now the central provinces are quite strong. Now the last element that I want to direct you to about the India map is that we have this elephant. The elephant shows the looming crisis and its position shows the belligerent and the target. So in this case Maratha over here with its strength 2 is thinking about revolting against Delhi, attacking its own, its own uh, capital. Uh, so it, it, it's a looming rebellion. Now, if, if, Marath, if the elephant were sitting here, what that would mean is Delhi is getting ready to attack Bengal and expand its empire. Or if, Bang, if the elephant were sitting here, it would mean Bengal is getting ready to attack Maratha and try to break into the Mughal Empire. But at the start of the scenario, there is this potential Marathan revolt that is just on the edge of happening. And indeed, historically, that's what happened in the early part of the 18th century. Now, the last element of the board is this red ribbon. And this red ribbon is the sequence of play. Um, John Company weirdly is, it's both the biggest game I've ever worked on and also like weirdly the easiest one to learn. And it's the easiest one to learn because the game holds your hand. It says, hey, there are nine phases every turn. Just, just take them one after another. And after you've done it once or twice, you'll, you'll know how, how the game works. You know, when, when I, I teach new players how to play Oath, they, they can spiral out because there are so many things that can happen and you're, you're, it's, you're, you're so free to do whatever you want. And John Company is a lot more processional uh, on purpose. And so uh, let's just go through the ribbon very briefly. Uh, the top of the ribbon right here is a turn track. So after completing the ribbon, we'll be advancing this track. And you can see on the track the starting points for the different scenarios in the game, 1710, 1758. 1813. Then we have uh, the London season, which is a phase that is skipped on the very first turn of the game. And after that, we have the family phase. And then if the company has lost its um, monopoly, we do a firm phase. Then the company hires to fill positions. And then we resolve all the company's positions in that order. Uh, then we resolve the China office if trade with China has been opened. We do bonuses, revenue, events in India, Parliament has a meeting, and then we do refresh at the end of the turn. And then, if everything's still okay, we're going to the, back to the start. We advance the turn track and continue on. Uh, generally, players are going to be scoring points in the London season, and so you're going to be doing all of these things, and then get to the London season, players are going to roll for retirements uh, and, 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 and score the big victory points of the game. During the very last turn of the game, if the company is successful, there's one more retirement round that happens. Um, okay, so that is the board, and it's it's a lot to chew on, and we 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 haven't talked about all the elements on it, but hopefully, uh, you've got a little bit of ground to stand on. Now there is one more thing that I need to mention um, about the game. So this is a negotiation game, and it's also a game that deals with risk, and oftentimes in the design you'll be asked to make a check. Now the way checks work in this design is you will roll a number of dice, usually you know. Uh, and, and usually there are ways to adjust the number of dice you're rolling. And then when you roll that dice, you only use the lowest number. And in the game, usually, a 1 and 2 is successful. A 3 or 4 is has n no effect. Basically, it's a null action. And a 5 or 6 is a catastrophic failure. And oftentimes, catastrophic failures mean that if you tried to do that and you had a catastrophic fail, your character is removed without a chance of retirement. So many things in this game are going to use that system of basically a die with three results. Um, and oftentimes when you're making a check, you're going to be rolling a number of dice. And again, just using the lowest number. Now, if you're curious about how the percentages work out, every player aid will have a little chance of success table on it. So you can see how, uh, how risky you might want to be. Um, all right. So that is, oh, not quite everything. There's one more thing I have to explain, which are these cards. Um, these cards are enterprises um, that can be purchased at, at different points in the game, uh, or they can be purchased during the family action, and players also start with them. Uh, but I just want to talk about their anatomy really quickly. So in the top left, there's a cost. So the luxury costs four pounds. Uh, in the top right is the enterprise price type. So this is a, a social luxury. I mean, it's a, a social enterprise, just like the Rotten Borough which means it will be worth two power at the end of the game. And then this bottom ri uh, ribbon uh, has attributes. Uh, so luxuries come with one window, they have some tax liability, and they're also worth two victory points. 
Uh, workshops uh, come with uh, an amount of money they generate every turn, so a workshop makes one dollar every turn. It comes with two votes, which is useful in the political phase, and then uh, they have a special thing that if the company fails, they're worth a, a, a victory point. Um, shipyards, uh, the way they work is when you buy a shipyard, uh, you take the ship listed, this is the diligence, um, and it is also worth a vote, and if you can find somebody to fit the diligence and to put it into service somewhere, it will also generate a little bit of revenue each turn. Uh, now, the reason why the shipyards behave a little bit like that is that shipbuilding was extremely expensive, uh, and so usually what, what happened was um, one company would build the ship, and then they would lease it to somebody who would handle all the, the fitting costs, and they would create different kinds of leasing and profit sharing arrangements based on the ships. I mean, because they were, you know, I mean, and, and that practice actually is even done today among many shipping companies. Um, okay, so that thus concludes the very first part of this of this video, which is, you know, it. A, just a general overview of, of the game systems. And so my hope is if you wanted to jump in the game right now with someone who knew it, you would be in an okay place. Uh, they would still need to teach you a lot, but you at least have some grounding. And now what we're going to do is talk about all the different phases in the game. And we're basically going to do this by going through a first turn. Uh, and I'm going to skip the London season for now because that is done, uh, it is skipped on the very first turn of the game. So the first thing that happens is we have the family. Uh, phase. Now one player is the chairman. In this case it happens to be yellow, so they have a big chairman marker to show that they're the chairman. Uh, and they get to begin, and clockwise every family is going to take one family action. Now the six family actions are as follows. Uh, you can enlist a writer, buy a shipyard, enlist an officer, buy a workshop, seek a share, or buy a luxury. So those are the, the six things that you can do, and they're pretty straightforward. So if you choose to enlist a writer, you take a piece, and you put it in one of the three writer boxes. Now, why are there three writer boxes, you might ask? Well, uh, trade in India was a complicated affair, and the East India Company had to use the system of presidencies, where it established three kind of trade zones, one based in Bengal, one in Madras, and one out of the city of Bombay. Um, and each of them had their own staffs and their own military apparatus, and so they're kind of like uh, like vice presidents, maybe, uh, in, in, in the corporate sense. And so when you choose to enlist a writer, you can ship off your kid to any one of the three presidents. And if your writer is shipped off to Bengal, then they're going to be doing things in Bengal, and in and around Bengal. Okay, so that's enlisting a writer. The next thing that you can do is you can enlist an officer. And when you do that, you put them on... Uh, this is Addiscombe, which is the uh, academy where officers were trained, and later they're going to be assigned to one of the three officer, uh, one of the three armies by uh, whoever's in charge of military affairs. So those are two of the six family actions. You can enlist a writer, you can enlist an officer. Now you can also buy shipyards, buy workshops, and buy luxuries, and that's very simple. You simply pay the cost and take the card. So if you had five pounds, you could buy a workshop. And then th this card just sits in your play area. Um, if you buy a shipyard, you have to take the matching ship. There are 22 different ships in the game. You almost never need all of them, but you, you can get close to that paper limit. In general, this game is strictly component limited, with the exception of things like money and stuff like that. Uh, so those are the three, uh, the three purchase actions. The last action is seeking a share. Uh, this is the most complicated family action, and basically the way it works is you put your piece on one of these spots in the Seek Share box. Now, uh, what you're doing here is you're going and you're trying to speculate on the market, and you can put your piece on any one of these boxes, but you have to spend the amount of money listed in the box. So I could say I'm going to put this piece at the 2 and this piece at the 5. Now, we'll talk about why you might want to spend extra money here later. Uh, but just know that this action just allows you to put your piece in, in, in this track on an empty spot. Okay, so those are the actions. Now, after you take an action, um, you move your opportunity disc, which is this red transparent disc. It's probably going to be a glass bead in the game. You're going to move it to the matching action that you took. So if you chose to enlist a writer, you get to uh, move your opportunity disc to that piece. Now, at, at the beginning of the game, your opportunity disc starts out of play. 
but it will be put into play after the, the first action. Now on future turns, when you take your family action, uh, if you are taking the action where your opportunity disc is, you get to take it twice. So on the very first turn of the game, uh, Larkins here could enlist a rider, and on the second turn of the game, because their opportunity disc is here, they could enlist two riders instead of one because they're developing kind of inertia in that direction. Now, whoops, um, if they had, let's say, chosen to buy a workshop, they would have to spend five to buy the workshop, and then next turn, they have the option of buying two workshops. Of course, it would cost 10 pounds, um, and that, 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 that's a very good reason to ask for a loan from another player, because you want to take advantage of where your opportunity token is. Uh, now, players do not have to stay taking that action for the rest of the game, but if they choose to enlist an officer, they will only get to enlist one officer. They also don't need to buy two workshops. They could just buy a single workshop. That's fine, too. Um, okay, great. Uh, yeah, and again, if, if you have any questions about this in the Discord for folks who are at San Diego Historicon, you are welcome to uh, ask those questions, and I'll try to clarify anything. Um, hopefully, you're, you're getting a sense that things are fairly simple at this point. Um, most of the actions in John Company are very, very, very simple. Uh, and in fact, in the rule book, uh, the, the rule book for this game is about twice as long as Pamir's, but it's only twice as long because there are lots of illustrations, lots of examples, and I really just tried to slow things down uh, and, and try to explain things as fulsomely as possible. So it's, it's very conversational. Um, okay. Um, this is also a good time to talk about um, things you can transfer. There is a list of things you can transfer right here, but basically anything that isn't flesh and blood, you can transfer. So I can't give you my officer, I can't give you my president or the chairman, but I could give you my workshop, I can give you money, I could vote for, give you supportive votes. Uh, the game only uh, enforces, uh, only makes binding immediate transfers and uh, conditions on these promise cards. Everything else is non-binding if it has to do with the future exchange. Um, and again, the, the list of what can be traded is, is, is here. Now, in the um, Historicon chat thread, I did put a link to the Steam mod for this game. Uh, it is currently public but unlisted. We will be listing it officially probably in about three or four weeks af after we finish the game. Uh, we are continually updating the mod, so I always recommend if you haven't played it in a couple weeks to turn off mod caching just so all the new assets uh, populate properly. Um, okay, so that is the family action. That's it. Uh, so at the start of the game, uh, you know, and if you're teaching new players, you just have to teach them those actions. And then we're off to the races. And the next thing we do is hiring. Now at the start of the game, there's nothing to hire because we've set up the game uh, in this way. And uh, by the way, when I'm talking, uh, I'll talk about setup when we talk about the events in India. Uh, so we're not worrying about setup right now. Um, but all the positions start full. Now if a position was not full, so for example, let's say military affairs was vacant, this office card would sit like this in uh, the vacant offices box. And the thing you need to know here is that every office card has a number of attributes. Uh, in the top right, it shows you the office symbol, so you know that we're talking about this office. In the top left is the hiring priority. So uh, offices are always hired from, from one to the, the highest number. I think there's like 20 different offices that can be uh, used in the game. Uh, so that priority number is in the top left. <clears throat> now every office has a person who fills it. Uh, military Affairs is chosen by the chairman. They are the hiring player. And on the right, they have their candidates. So in this card, on this card it says, hey, if you're hiring for this, uh, the chairman will consider commanders. If there are no commanders, they'll consider officers. If there are none, they will consider officers in training. Now if there are none, if there are no candidates after all of those candidates have been exhausted, uh, the office will just remain vacant, and, and offices can stay vacant. Um, usually when an office is, is vacant, um, it is just skipped over, uh, and, and it just doesn't, it doesn't act. Um, okay, so, sorry, one second. Um, okay, had to have a drink there. Um, so uh, the offices are pretty straightforward. Uh, the main thing you need to know about hiring is that um, there is something called the nepotism rule. The nepotism rule says you can't hire yourself if there are other candidates. So for example, if Blue was the chairman and they were being asked to choose a commander to be the new military affairs, their options are Blue, 
or green, but because they are blue, they can't hire their own family unless green says it's okay. And this means that you could give green some money. Or maybe green doesn't even want it because green has things they want to do in the army. They're not done being commander of the army of Bombay yet. So if other players give you consent for nepotism, you, you are allowed to hire yourself, but only if all other candidates for that job give you consent for nepotism. Now, um, by the way, speaking of consent for nepotism, that is one of the uh, promises that you can offer to other players. So... For example, if you uh, maybe you bought this from a player for a pound early in the game, and you said, "Hey, you know, I can I can use this as can, to force you to give consent," which you know wouldn't be able to do. Um, okay, uh, so in this instance, uh, imagine that Green's consent for nepotism card was owned by Blue. They could give that back to 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 um, to Green in order to pass up this person. Okay, so that's how uh, most hiring works. The one exception to how uh, to uh, how hiring works there is uh, one office is hired in a different manner than all the others, and that's the office of the chairman. So you'll note that the chairman is the first office hired, and it's also not chosen by an office. It's chosen by the court of directors. Now, the court of directors are these five fine folks, uh, and we will... Uh, chairman for now for the sake of example uh, the court of directors these pieces are shares so they actually don't really represent people so much as uh, stacks of paper uh, and the the chairman is chosen by the court of directors and the candidates are any pieces in the court of directors and the way this works is this is kind of a free-for-all where as soon as one player the former chairman usually announces how many shares are needed for a majority in this case three because there are five uh, in total, and uh, players will uh, see which player can be the first to secure five, uh, or not five, three uh, shares in support. Uh, so, for example, blue could say, hey, green, will you support me? And purple, will you support me? And if they can win that fight, they can have themselves elected chairman. Uh, but, so, whereas blue would need both of these players' support, yellow only needs one of them in order to secure the chairmanship. If there's a deadlock, if no one can decide, the former chairman gets to pick from among any current shareholder. Uh, and that's, that, by the way, is why we have this big chairman marker, because it marks also who the former chairman was. Uh, okay, that's the hiring phase. And, and that's it. The hiring phase is easy. Now we begin the company phase. And the company phase um, is resolved in ribbon order, and basically... Uh, usually we have the chairman call this out, but it could be anybody at the table, the bossiest player maybe, sitting at the table. Uh, they will call out each office, and that office will take their turn. Now, every office, as I mentioned earlier, is co corresponds to an office card, which you can see listed here. Um, and uh, these office cards work like little play aids. Uh, and so what I'm going to be doing when I first introduce the office is basically just talking you through uh, the office card. And then we'll move to the next office. Now, these uh, there is also going to be a player aid. It's not done yet. Um, I have half of the player aid done, but not the back. And the back will have an extended um, example, not an example, but an extended description of how each office works. Um, whereas the actual office cards are a little bit briefer, um, and they kind of assume you already know the rules of the game. But let's see how we do here. So um, basically, let me give a, a little overview before I jump into the examples. Um, the offices are resolved starting in London. And so most of this is like organizational, logistical things, planning. Then the last three offices that act are the presidencies, which involve actions within India. Um, now, this might seem like, oh, God, we have to listen to all these different phases, but there are lots of, um, of homogenies between the different, fa uh, the different offices. So if you know how one presidency operates, you know how all of them operate. Okay, so let's start with the chairman. So the chairman can seek debt up to the track max. You may take three debt with, uh, you can take more than three debt with the court's approval. Um, so uh, you get five pounds per debt, and then you allocate your company balance. I'll hold that up for another second. One second, I have to respond to a quick message. Okay, so 
Uh, let's talk through that. So the company has debt here, and so the chairman can take up to three debt doot, 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 um, without, the, without the company's approval. He can just do that. And for every debt taken, this company balance track right here is going to increase by five for each. So the game uh, starts with five, always five, no matter the scenario. And if the, if the chairman chooses to take three debt, suddenly the company will have 20. Uh, then the chairman must allocate all of this money. And now where are they allocating it to? Well, they're allocating it to these different offices. Offices all have their own, uh, many offices have their own treasuries and they will, when, they, when the office is asked to spend money, they will spend the money from their treasury. Okay, so uh, let, let's imagine, for instance, for the sake of example, that they want to take eight debt. Well, the chairman is allowed to take eight debt, but they need the approval of the court. And in this case, um, the, the court, let me actually check a quick thing, because this is a rule that is always just changed and adjusted and adjusted. Um, Okay, um, so uh, you, uh, oh my gosh, goodness. Uh, yes. So the, the, the chairman still counts as a share here. So in this case, um, so the, the rule I was looking up, which is a rule that has changed a few times, and I always have to check it because my, my brain is scrambled after three years of development, is um, the chairman is a funny office because it still counts as a share when it comes to things like dividends and for things like debt approval. So currently, uh, if the chairman wanted to take out eight debt, they would need the approval of the court. They control three shares on the court, uh, but they need a majority, so they need to get uh, a fourth member to agree with it. And this is probably a horrible thing for a chairman to do on the first turn. So let's imagine that none of that happened, but I just wanted folks to realize that they could um, take take a, a, a lot of debt as the chairman. Okay, sorry about that delay. Um, all right, so then the chairman has to allocate funds. They have five funds right here, and what they do is they're just going to spend down to zero and they can spread this money maybe they put one here one here maybe they want to put two over here doesn't matter uh it's up to them and this is a place where players will negotiate and try to get favoritism and try to get money budgeted to their pet projects and things like that so that is the operation of the chairman we're all done with the chairman we next go to the director of trade here's the director of trade now, the director of trade can take envoy actions and then may transfer two pieces and they can transfer boats or riders. So let's talk about what envoy actions are. So on the left, you'll see that there, there are two sections to the way this action diagram works. There's the dice pool and then what happens when there's success. Uh, you'll note that it doesn't say what happens when there's failure, but that's because it's handled the, the same way always. If it's a null action, uh, you can continue acting, nothing has changed. If it's a catastrophic failure, which is to say if your lowest roll was a five or six, the office, the, the office holder is removed. Disgrace. Uh, but let's talk about how, you, how these work. Your dice pool is the number of dice that you roll. And you'll see here that for every one pound that you spend from the office treasury, of course, you get a die. So in this case, the director of trade could spend three, if they wanted to, to roll three dice. And so they're going to take the envoy action. Now, what, the, what does the envoy action do? Well, if you're successful, you have two options. You can open trade with China, or you can open one order in a region not controlled by the company. Start of the game, no regions are controlled by the company, uh, but you can, so you can order, uh, you can open orders in any region. So in this case, they could, for instance, open this order. Opening an order just means removing a closed token. Whoops. So like that. Okay, now if they were open, uh, if they were to open uh, China, the way that works is uh, they would create this new office, and over to the side, we have all of these new offices, and so they would create the Superintendent of Trade in China office, and we would put this little China uh, overlay right here, and the Superintendent of Trade of China, let's say that's what they spent their money on. Uh, it's usually hired in the uh, vacant offices 
but the moment that it's created, it's hired immediately uh, if it's created with the uh, special envoy. Uh, so the candidates are the writers. It's chosen by the, the chairman. So, for instance, the chairman could say, hey, Blue, I want you to be the superintendent of trade in China. And then this office is created and given to. Um, I will talk about how the uh, superintendent of trade in China works when we get to the China phase down here. But that is one thing that the director of trade can do. Now, uh, opening the trade in China office at the very start of the game is a bad idea. But for sake of example, I'll show you how it, how it works. Uh, okay, next up we have the director of shipping. Oh, no, sorry, we have to do the transfers. Uh, the director of trade then gets to transfer two pieces. They are allowed to transfer riders uh, or ships. Now, uh, ships are transferred from these different sea zones. So, for example, they could transfer uh, the constant friend here over to the China sea zone. Or they might decide they want to transfer the atlas to the eastern sea zone. Now, each presidency, you'll see, is associated with a home port, which is in the thicker black line. And every home port is associated with the sea zone. So President Bombay is associated with the Western Sea, uh, which is mostly um, the Arabian Sea. Uh, the southern, the, the presidency of Madras is associated with the Southern Sea, which is mostly the Indian Ocean. And then over here, President of Bengal is associated with the Eastern Sea, which is the Indian Ocean, then down into the, uh, the Bay of Bengal which is right here. Um, okay, so the director of trade can move things around. They get two moves, and they can use those moves to, for instance, move a rider if they want, or move a ship, or do one of each, or two of one. doesn't matter. Okay, that's the director of trade. We now move on to the director of shipping. Uh, and this should read manager of shipping, and will read manager of shipping after we do the next uh, board update. Um, because I, I should say many of these... You know, like uh, these family boards are still going through layout. This thing hasn't been put through layout in a long time. So the, the, there's a lot of like little incongruities in this mod that we're ironing out. Um, okay, so manager of shipping. Uh, let me make a note here so I don't forget to talk about something later. Um, all right, guys. And cool. All right, let's talk about the manager of shipping. So, uh, the manager of shipping has to fit ships until your office has at most two pounds remaining. So this is a very junior position. You're actually compelled to spend all the money except uh, two pounds. Uh, and you're allowed to spend down to zero, but you, but you can't hold a bunch of money in this position. Um, now, there's a lot of things you can spend your money on. Um, you can fit ships. So there are three different types of ships in the game. Uh, there are blue ships, which are owned by players. So let, let's use the example of the diligence here which we'll say is owned by green. And uh, we would put it right here. Uh, blue ships are owned by players. Um, they are, are player owned in some stage of construction. Uh, and then we also have black ships, which are called extra ships. Extra ships are ships that are on, oops, that are under uh, short term leases. So these are ships that instead of, you know, usually when the East India Company would lease ships, they would lease them for five or even 10 year terms. Um, and these ships were worn down quite a bit, so often they would need extensive repairs and refitting at the end of that time. Uh, extra ships were ships just uh, lent out for the single uh, single trade season. Um, so we have extra ships, and then the last type of ships we have are company ships, which are ships owned and maintained by the company directly. So uh, the, the manager of shipping is responsible for uh, purchasing ships, and they can buy... Um, they can uh, fit extra ships for two pounds, and they can fit player ships for three pounds. That money is sent to the bank, um, and then the ship is placed in any zone. So, for example, uh, let's say they wanted to fit this player ship. They could spend three pounds, one, two, three, to t put this ship, and then they get to decide maybe they want to put it in that southern sea zone for whatever reason. Um, or if they didn't want to do that, they would be welcome to instead purchase one extra ship. Or, because they have an additional two pounds now, they could purchase a second extra ship. So, you know, a, a director, a manager of shipping with four pounds in his treasury kind of can spend three to get one player ship and could spend, or could spend four to get two extra ships or two to get one extra ship. Um, critically, these extra ships are only good for one turn, and then they, during the refresh phase, they'll go back to the supply. Now, the last thing that you'll see on the right is that if all player ships are fitted, 
you're allowed to fit company ships, which cost five. And company ships are sort of great. Uh, because the company handles all of the expenses for their maintenance uh, and upkeep, they are never destroyed. They sit there the entire game. They can still be moved around like any other ships. But whereas player ships are subject to the fate of storms, company ships are as good, as healthy as can be. Um, okay, so that is what the manager of shipping does. Okay, next we have the military affairs office, which is sort of like a weird combination of these two. So the first thing military affairs does is they can transfer uh, two pieces. And those transfers are offices, officers, which are the pistols, and regiments, which are the drums. And they can transfer them between armies. So for example, they could say, I want to use my first transfer to move this regiment here, and my second transfer to use this regiment here. That would be a very reasonable thing for them to do. After they've finished with that, any players who have um, officers, whoops, say there are two, um, we'll do it like this. Let's say we have this for a situation. Um, any pieces that are in the officers and training box get assigned to different armies. And then the very last step, which is not on this card for some reason, but I'll, I'll put it back. It just got deleted, I guess, by accident. Um, the last step is that they check for commanders. So basically, um, the player with the most officers in an army is going to become the commander. And if there's a tie, like this, they just stay in, 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 in the current position. So by, by directing two um, offices officers to the army of Bombay, they can dislodge the screen, the screen commander. Okay, and that is the military affairs um, office. So you can see the, the pistol icon there represents an officer. The pistol above the school building is an officer in training. The drum is the regiment, and in fact these uh, counters, when I get to actually designing them, uh, will feature the drum. And then those little cannons are the three different armies. All right, that's military affairs. And at this point, hop on our boat and leave London and head to India for the work of the presidencies. Now, the presidencies are um, the thing that makes the companies work. It's, you, know, you might be asking, boy, I've seen a lot of ways to spend money, but I haven't yet encountered a way that the company can make money. Well, all of those things are housed in the presidencies. And the presidencies all work the same way. So you know, there are three different presidencies in the game. Here are two, the president of Bombay and the president of Bengal. And even though uh, they look different, and one of them has a lot more hair on his head, although that's probably a wig, um, they have the same text. Uh, and so once I teach you how one presidency works, you will know how all presidencies work. Um, okay, so let's talk about the presidency of Bengal. I'm oh, sorry, Bombay. That's the first one. Now, presidencies will have junior offices associated with them later in the game. Uh, there might be a governor of Bombay, and maybe also, you know, for instance, like it's possible that Bombay and that Mysore are under company control. And in that case, we would have uh, little little overlays sitting on different regions of, of India. Uh, those all those offices operate underneath the presidency of Bombay. So a presidency basically corres uh, corresponds with. Uh, everything in their presidency, which is their fleet of ships, their staff of writers. Uh, a writer, by the way, is a, is a clerk, is a, is a junior trader. Uh, their governorships, which manage the administration of the various regions, and then also uh, their army. So in this case, the presidency of Bombay is also in charge of the army of Bombay. Uh, but at the start of the game, um, we, we don't have any regions owned in this scenario, and so presidencies are only in command of themselves. So let's take a look at their card. So the first thing a presidency a president does is they decide the order in which their associated um, positions act, and that includes themselves. So they could say, you know what, I want to act first. Then we'll have our governors act. Then we'll have the commander act last. Or they could say, you know what, I want to see how the the invasion goes. Let's have the commander act first, and then I'll act, and then maybe we have the governors act last. Doesn't matter. It's up to the president. The key rule here is that one office needs to fin be finished acting before the president can. 
uh, ask another office to act. And um, the last thing is that uh, the president can't skip over an office. They can't say, I don't want to hear from you, Commander of Bombay. <laughs> um, they have to give them some opportunity to act. And uh, they can never compel them to act, uh, but they just have to give them an opportunity to act. Okay, so let's talk about the actions that uh, the president has. So the president's action is the trade action, which is the way the company makes money. And you'll see on the left how the dice pool works. So like the uh, director of trade in his envoy action earlier, uh, every dollar that the president spends, and again, this is a dollar from the company's treasury, turns into a die. And so you can build a dice pool by spending money. When you take the trade action, you have to declare a number of regions which you want to trade with. So you could say, I want to trade with uh, Bombay and Mysore. And if you make that declaration, you'll note that there is a dice with a slash through it. And you have to lower your trade by one die for every other region declared. So for each non-home region that you've declared. So in this instance, um, I could say as the president of Bombay that I want to spend all three of my dollars for three dice. And then I want to trade in, uh, well, you know, let's give the president more ships. Uh, so this example makes sense. Um, I want to trade in Bombay and in Mysore. So that means I have to subtract one of my dice. So I'm only rolling two dice, and I will go ahead and roll those two dice. My lowest result is a four, which means it wasn't a catastrophic failure. It was just a regular old failure. Did the game, or in other words, it did not succeed. And um, what that means is that I don't get to do anything. Now let's imagine that had been a success. So it's a risky play, by the way. You can see that rolling two dice and getting a success is a 56% chance. But maybe green here took a gamble and, uh, and, and, and got it through. So what do you do? Well, the number of orders that a president can fulfill depends on the number of ships they can trade. And by the way, you can't, like, declare that you're going to trade in eight regions or something and only have two ships. Like, you, you have to only declare regions that you actually intend on trading in. Um, so the way this works is uh, you may fill one order for every ship in your associated sea zone. So we have three orders that we can fill. And the orders uh, have to be connected to each other and have to start at the port. So for example, they could say, I want to fill this four order in Bombay, come down to Mysore and fill this three order, and then I'm going to come down to Mysore again and fill this six order. Now, uh, to mark that you filled the orders, you're going to cover those pieces with riders. So here, here's that order filled, and then we advance our revenue by four. Now, I still have two ships that I want to fill with, so I want to fill these, but I'm out of riders. If you're out of riders, that's no trouble. You just flip over these extra closed tokens, and they turn into generic riders, which you can just use to mark that the orders have been filled. So that was a four, a three, and a six. So that's a total of 13. And those 13 pounds are put on the company's balance track down here at the bottom. Now, over here on the right, you'll notice a couple things. First, we filled orders and, and completed the company and, and increased the company balance as, as listed under success. But now you note that the president gains one pound per order filled as a special bonus. And bonuses are always marked with a green box. So in this instance, the president has filled three orders, so they're going to go ahead and take three pounds into their personal treasury. And this represents petty graft and also like making sure that you, uh, you're hooking up your friends and, and maybe a little bit of just outright theft. And then at the bottom, it says players gain one for each rider. So in this case, one rider w w was placed green and they get one pound. In this case, green gets yet another pound from completing this trade. If they had placed a blue rider, for instance, um, they uh, blue would also get, get a pound from this. Um, a president is compelled to place riders if they can, um, but if, uh, if, if they're out of riders, yeah, but if there's excess riders, they of course get to decide which riders go and which riders stay. Okay, so that's how the president works. Next up, we have to talk about the commanders. Now, remember, uh, a president can decide that the commander goes before them or after them. It's totally up, it's totally up to them. Uh, 
And so we're going to imagine in this instance that the president went first and that now it's the commander's turn. Now a commander uh, has access to an action called the deploy action. And in order to understand how the deploy action works, I first need to talk about some military strength. So every piece here in the top of an army box, and I know these are small, we're going to make them a little bit. Uh, every piece in the top of an army box is a strength point. And by exhausting those pieces, they can spend strength. And that strength, you guessed it, turns into dice, uh, which they then use for their action, which is called the deploy action. Now, uh, when a commander starts their turn, uh, the first thing that they will do is uh, decide if they want to beg the president for any money to hire local alliances. Local alliances are right here. So the Army of Bombay can hire uh, the Rajputs here in Rajasthan, or they can hire the Sikhs. Um, the cost of uh, enlisting their help is listed below, and the strength of the piece is listed above. Now, these pieces are all strength one. Um, Rajasthan is going to have a strength of three if they join up. I wish I could make these pieces really big, but they just don't. They wouldn't fit. Um, so, uh, the way this works... Oh, hello, Drew's hand. Uh, <laughs> um... So the way this operates is um, first the command, and I, I wish I could uh, show you a player aid, but I haven't uh, finished the commander player aid. Uh, but basically, they get to take the deploy action after they've decided if they want to hire alliances. The way, uh, oh, sorry, that's what I was going to say. So the way hiring alliances works is uh, they have to ask the president for money. In this case, the president of Bombay has no money, and so there's no reason to ask. Uh, but if they had money, it's up to the president to allow them to spend money to hire these local alliances. Now, what they can do now is they can take the deploy action. And the eligible targets are always the home region associated with the army. So they can always choose Bombay. Uh, if they don't want to do Bombay, they can, uh, they can also choose a region they have already conquered or they can choose a region adjacent to one that has been conquered, that is company controlled. So if they deploy in Bombay and, and come to control it on future turns, they can attempt to deploy in any adjacent region. Now, how does the deploy action work? Well, every piece that is exhausted gives the player a die. And then they look at the target that they're attempting to attack. And the height of the tower that they are targeting is the number of dice that are removed. So they would have a strength of three exhausted, and then they have to remove one die, which leaves them with just two dice. They roll those dice, they take the lower result, in this case it's a failure. Um, no matter what happens, every single officer who was exhausted needs to roll a die to see if they die, and the officer is removed on a six. So in this case, two dice would be thrown, one for blue, one for green. And on a six, the officer got killed or decided to go home or whatever. Now, that's what happened with a failure. With a failure, let's, imagine, let's talk about what happened with a success. Now, if there was a success, we have to do a few things. Um, we still take an officer death check, but then we pay out loot. The loot value is four for each level of the tower, so in this case, just four pounds plus whatever's on this token, too. So there's six loot to be paid. And the way loot works is that you start with the commander in the army, and they're going to take one loot for their commander, and then they're going to take one loot for each of their officers. So imagine a pool of, and we'll use these tokens maybe as dollars to show for this example. Uh, this is like one of those things that's easier with the game's currency uh, than it is in TTS. But we have six loot total. That's two for the loot. Uh, token and two because or and four because we're, we have one tower level here. The way the loot is paid out is first the commander takes one, and then starting with the commander they take one for each of their officers, and then we go clockwise around the table and we eventually get to green who takes one, and then the regiment takes one for itself but that is just paid to the bank. Then if loot remains we do it again. The commander takes one for their bonus and then the commander takes one for each of their officers. So at the end of this adventure, uh, blue here would gain four uh, pounds in loot, and green would get one. Definitely pays to be the commander, definitely pays to have an extra officer or two. In. Um, okay, cool. 
Now, uh, sometimes, uh, rarely, but it, it does happen, especially in the late game, uh, there's not enough loot to even make it through a single round of payouts. When that happens, you go ahead and boost the loot to equal the number of officers and, and the commander so that everybody gets at least one, one pound. Uh, okay. So, uh, after that, if, uh, if an attack is successful, this loot token is removed from the board. It will never go back to the board. And it gets associated with, a, uh, with the, the, the presidency that was linked to the army that conquered it. And uh, we get to create a new office. Uh, there's a big stack of governorships. Here it is, the governor of Bombay. I'll be talking about how the governors work in the uh, third part of this talk. So we're not going to worry about governors yet. Uh, but they become vacant and they will be hired next turn. Uh, also, we remove the tower that was associated with the region. And then um, there are going to be pieces. I don't have any right now. I wonder if it would let me... Make, a, make something. Anyway, there are going to be pieces that are uh, company overlays, which will sit. I'm designing them literally tonight. You're going to sit on the map, and then you will put, when you have a governor, you just put them on top of that piece to show that this player is the governor of that region. Um, okay, go away. Uh, all right, that is everything associated with presidents and commanders. So uh, those are, in some respects, like the most complicated actions of, of the game that players take. And now that we've got through one presidency, well, we get through all three presidencies because they all work the same way. Um, all right. So once we have finished with all the presidencies, we resolve the China office. The China office is very simple. Um, basically, it will have a number of ships on it that can be directed there during the game. And the China player has the option to sail or not sail. If they sail, they roll one die for every ship. Uh, and if they're successful, uh, the company makes an amount of money that depends on the number of opium icons on the board. And we'll talk more about uh, how that works later. You can see it here. Or I guess I, I can talk about it now. Uh, the, the, the company increases balance by four pounds per opium icon in controlled regions. Now, at the start of the game, the reason why this is a bad move at turn one is the company doesn't control any opium regions. So this is not like a very lucrative place to put your boats. Um, and their bonus is they get one per opium icon on controlled regions. Most of the opium in India was grown in eastern India, so that's where a lot of the opium mines exist. Again, the map is filled with abstractions, uh, so there are lots of notable exceptions to that, too. Um, okay. So, that's the China office. Now we do player bonuses. Uh, basically, any player who has... Uh, you know, enterprises that have bonus values on them or things like that are going to go ahead and take those bonuses now as income. Uh, and that's all there is to the bonuses phase. And then we do revenue. Now, the way revenue works is this is this phase is usually uh, uh, it, it's run collectively. There aren't very many choices in it. Uh, but the very first thing that needs to happen is the company needs to pay its expenses. Now, the company pays expenses for uh, three things, its debts, its armies and its ships. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to count up all of the expenses the company owns. So there are two ships in China and three in the Western Indian Sea for a total of five. So that's five expenses. Uh, and then we count the number of pieces in armies. Uh, you don't include uh, exhausted... Or yeah, you, sorry, you're only... Uh, let me get my tongue back on my mouth. Uh, you only count officers and regiments. So the expenses are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we have 5 ships and 6 for the armies. So that's a total of 11. And we then lower our revenue that's been generated so far by 11, so from 13 to 12. At that point, after we've paid expenses, we need to check the company's expectations. Um, so the way expectations work is right now with our standing, it was expected that we would have, um, if we had more than expectations, uh, sorry, if we had less than expectations after paying expenses, in this case, we only have two pounds, and people really thought that we were going to have ten. So because of that, our standing falls one space. Then the chairman, but... but Let's imagine, for an instance, that we actually had 10 pounds left. We met expectations. That's great. Uh, then we, oops, 
we go to check dividends. Now this is a decision made by the chairman and the chairman alone. Uh, and they can elect to pay dividends. Every dividend is going to pay one pound to the chairman and each member of the court. So in this case, each dividend costs the company six pounds. Uh, three of those are going to go to yellow, one to purple, one to blue, one to green. So they can choose to pay six pounds in dividends. So that would lower the uh, balance sheet from 10 pounds to four. Uh, and players would take that money. Now, you'll note that there is a little red arrow right here which says if you paid out more than an expectations in dividends. So if our total dividend payout was more than 10 pounds, the company standing improves. So if we had 12 pounds, for instance, we could pay out two dividends. The first would take us to six, the second would take us to zero. If we did that, each one of these players is gonna make two pounds instead of one pound per piece in this area. Uh, and then, because we paid out 12 pounds in total dividends, our little standing goes up, increasing expectations. Uh, now, that is um, not all the ways standing can move. You might ask yourself, boy, you know, after our, our whole turn, we only had two pounds left in the initial example. What would have happened if we wouldn't have had any? Well, if we wouldn't have had any, we'd have to take emergency debt. And the way company debt works is every time we advance this piece, we generate five pounds to pay expenses. If we had any left over, like let's say we had um, we had minus one uh, pounds in our company balance sheet, we could take out a single company debt to cover that expense. That four pounds that was left over, that gets lost to the ether. It's just gone. Uh, and then if we took one to two emergency loans, we go down one spot in our standing. If we took three or or emergency loans, this should have a plus on it, I think, we would go down uh, two spots. I'm going to make note of that because I have to send my, my notes to our, our board designer. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Now, uh, the, the company at various times can also lose regions that they had controlled. And if they lose one region in a turn, the first region is only going to lower standing by once. Uh, by one space. If they lose two regions in a turn, it's going to lower standing by two spaces. If they're going to lose three regions, or sorry, bleh, I'm explaining this poorly. The first region they lose this turn lowers standing by one. If they lose a second region, they're going to lower standing by an additional two. And if they lose uh, a region for the third time, uh, by an additional three. And that will usually uh, outright in, in the company uh, when that happens. Okay, so after that, we go to the events in India's phase. The way this works is we're going to roll this die. And the die has two things on it. It has a storm and it has a number. And the number is the number of events that happen. And the storm is uh, the, the, where the ships are threatened. So uh, the Eastern India storm actually includes China. But for sake of example, I'll just put these boats over here. When a storm happens, you roll a die for every boat. On a one or two, the boat is healthy as can be. On a three or four, the boat is fatigued. Um, and on a five or six, the boat is destroyed. Now, if a fatigued boat is fatigued again, it is destroyed. And when a boat is destroyed, it is returned to the owning player's shipyard. So in this case, the Atlas comes back to the yellow player. Uh, so yeah, it's a, little, it's a dangerous to sail the seas. You don't need to roll for storms for extra ships or company ships, just for player ships. Uh, then we resolve the events in India. Uh, now, the, uh, we use these, these circular event tiles, uh, which are going to be kind of one millimeter, really nice, um, chunky punch board uh, event tiles. And we are going to resolve as many as the number of the dice. Now, I, one thing I'll say about this dice is there is a face on the dice that is four events, and there's another face on the dice are there two vases that say four, and there's one face that has storms in all regions. Uh, now, uh, the way this is going to work, though, is we're going to resolve two events, because that, that's the number on the die. And the way this works is you flip a region, you, you flip an event, and you resolve that event. Sometimes events will resolve around where the elephant is, like this one. Sometimes events will happen where the top pictured uh, event is, and sometimes a combination of both. So in this case, we, re we resolve a crisis. And what I'll say right here, addressing the camera directly, <laughs> is I'm going to resolve these events and briefly talk to them, but I will be doing a full event explanation in the next section of the video. 
Uh, so a crisis means that we resolve where the elephant is. In this case, uh, the Marathan revolt against um, against uh, Delhi and the, the Mughal Empire. Uh, the strength of this is the strength of the belligerent. In this case, a tower level of two versus a tower level of one. Um, and it's modified in more, more than that by an additional plus one. So we've got three versus one. That is obviously a success for Maratha, which because of that success, um, whoops, let me uh, show that it's no longer dominated. They've broken free. And at that point, the elephant marches on and it marches to Maratha again because Maratha is the top pictured region of the, of the deck and it will point to the triangle. So you'll see that this border, the border between Maratha and Bengal is marked with the triangle, which means the elephant comes to sit here. That basically means that after they're breaking free from the Mughals, they look to expand their influence eastward. All right, now we have to resolve two events. So the next event is flipped. It's another crisis. In this case, Maratha, which is a sovereign independent state, is fighting Bengal, which is also a sovereign and independent state. The strength of Maratha is two plus three, as indicated on the tile. So they will clobber Bengal. And the consequence of that is, oops, I have to, my UI, is a new empire is born. And so Maratha is the capital, and we can call this Empire B and Bengal is the dominated region. So the Maharathan Confederacy is off to a very early start in this particular game. Now, you'll note at the bottom of this card that the elephant could be directed two ways. If the crisis that was resolved involved a capital region being formed or growing, the elephant is going to stay in this region. So normally the elephant would jump to Madras, but because the Maratha is, is becoming ambitious. The elephant stays in this region and we go to the circle border. In this case, it's Bombay. Now, if the Marathans already controlled Bombay, we would just go clockwise to the next region. So this is where the elephant is going to sit next. So it's looking like a very big uh, and kind of historically somewhat accurate, uh, although maybe on fast forward, uh, sequence of events is happening. Okay, again, uh, I will be talking more about the event phase later. Uh, but just know that, um, that that will be coming up. Okay, uh, and also the, the crisis is the most involved of all of the events in the game, um, and many of the events are, ver are very straightforward. Okay, so uh, how are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Let's talk about the Parliament meets phase of the game. So the way this works is one player is the Prime Minister. In this case, that's Purple. And Purple has this uh, lovely wheel. Now, uh, for folks who were at my talk yesterday, you saw um, I'll, something I will share with you right now, which is, uh, let me get to it. Uh, the actual Prime Minister wheel is going to have a lovely, uh, a lovely little hand that we are currently figuring out how to make work perfectly. Um, but it will look like this, so that it is always directing at one at one place, uh, and this is because I love Victorian board games, and I want more weird Victorian nonsense in my in my aesthetics for this game. Uh, so basically, uh, the, the Prime Minister is always pointing at a, a, a policy. Now, what's going to happen here is the Prime Minister is going to get a law, uh, and the, let's just talk about what, what these laws mean. So one, uh, we're going to vote on this law. If this law passes, this becomes a permanent rule of the game. Uh, and so, uh, trade regulations. Each President's bonus is now added to the company balance, so that the, that money, that three pounds that was generated by the by the president of Bombay, that would then just go straight to the company baseline, which is great for the company and not so good for the presidents. Now uh, the public doesn't really like this, so it's starting at negative one votes, which is down here. And the way this track works is anything that is zero or higher that has the double line is a pass, and anything that has the single line a fail. Um, okay, so that's that's how the, this law would work if it would pass. Now, if the uh, the other thing you need to know about the law is that all laws in this game are coupled by a policy. And uh, if you've played Candyland, you'll know how this next part works. Uh, the prime minister must decide to either move the policy arm. So you know, the arm. Oops, the arm. They have to move the arm uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. And 
they have to stop at the first space that matches this, so the first anchor they get to, which means their policy proposal could be they want to give shipyard enterprise shipping enterprises more power. I'll do that. Sorry, they could give shipping enterprises more power, or they could give they could decide to tax shipping enterprises. So it's up to them. And if they own a lot of shipping pro enterprises, they probably want to give them more power. And if they don't, they probably want to tax. So let's say they decide they want to give them more power. Now we go into the vote. So that they move their arm to show the policy and they announce the policy to the table. They say, we're voting on trade, reg trade regulations. Here's what it does. And the policy effect is that shipyards are going to get more power. Uh, now let's talk, uh, and then, then we go into a vote. And I'll talk more about how the policies work in a second. So the way the vote works is uh, starting with the prime minister, they cast a number of votes. Um, they can tap any of their enterprises that have vote icons on them, can be tapped for the number indicated of votes, which they use to increase on this track. Um, and then they can also spend money. Every pound they spend is, is a vote. Uh, and they go around the table, just a single time around the table. Um, after, you get, after they get back to their turn, uh, they can decide to end the vote and go with its current result, or they can do another round of voting. Uh, and this means that sometimes when the result of a, of a law is obvious, they can resolve it right away. And if the result is not clear after a single round of voting, they can call for additional votes. They can do that so long as the votes are changing. I mean, if people want to burn all their money voting, uh, the game doesn't stop them. Uh, if it passes, the prime minister is rewarded with a... Where are they? Oh, here they are. Um, the Prime Minister is rewarded with a past law trophy, which just sits right here. Uh, oh, I, I forgot to mention these with commanders. Um, commanders, when they conquer a region, they get uh, trophies equal to the number of, um, of strength points in the region. One thing about trophies is that they can get lost if commanders embarrass themselves. I'll be talking about this in, in the next section a little bit. But they, they get know that the Prime Minister gets power for passing a law. If they do not pass the law, the person who cast the most votes against it um, gets to choose a reaction, a thermostatic policy, a reaction policy that is adjacent. So the leader of the opposition can choose to tax shares or tax social enterprises and windows. Uh, and then they steal the uh, prime minister wheel from the player who was, who was the prime minister. Um, okay. So, uh, I haven't talked about all the things relating to uh, voting yet, and there's a, there are a couple important details. So, one important detail is what the heck do these policies actually do? So, let's take a look at them. Uh, there are three different types. There are power, taxes, and bonuses. Uh, we'll take those in, um, in a kind of scattered order. Bonuses are the green ones. They're the very simple ones. Basically, it means that you make one pound for each of those things that you have. So if we do a bonus on workshop enterprises, everybody gets a buck from the bank for every uh, workshop enterprise they have. Great, good for them, bully. Uh, if they win on power, they go over here to the little power tree and they can swap. Let's say workshops won on power, they could swap uh, it with an adjacent tile. And now this means that company shares are not worth any power at the end of the game and workshops are worth one. And finally, if they won on tax, uh, it means that all players have to pay one pound for each of those things that they have. So this is a, a pound on uh, company shares. Um, and that would be over here. These company shares, for instance, um, you would need to pay one pound for each of these shares. You do not have to pay a pound for each share. Uh, okay. Uh, now, some of these also have a window tax that, that is featured. Uh, the window tax means that you also have to pay a pound for each window, and that is following the usual window rule. So if you had a person here, for instance, and there was a window tax, you would need to pay an additional three pounds for the window tax. Okay, let me check for questions. We're looking good. Uh, all right, so that's how the different policies work. Now, the last thing is the, par the prime minister does not have to vote on the first law. Um, when they are drawing laws, there is a deck of you know 23 odd laws, and they may draw up to three. Now, if they don't like this one, they don't have to take it, and they can draw a second law. Let's save that one for later, and save this one for later. <laughs> There's a law. 
Uh, okay, so they draw this law, they can consider it. They're welcome to go back and pick the first law. They can choose from either of these two laws. Now you might ask yourself, why wouldn't they just uh, draw three laws always? Well, there's a chance that they draw a, a, a dilemma. And if there's a dilemma, they must pick it. They, do, they, they, they These are no longer in the offer, they're gone. Um, and all of the, uh, the things relating to it are listed here. Uh, the very last thing I have to mention, I, I've done the, this, this explanation of the parliamentary phase, I apologize, it's been a little scattered, uh, is that the prime minister, whatever law they bring or dilemma they're forced to bring, or dilemma they're forced to bring, uh, they have to vote for it. This is a parliamentary system. Uh, you can't just be in the opposition forever. You have to actually stand for something, uh, or at least we'd like to think that. Uh, and so uh, if the prime minister, um, the prime minister is forced to support, uh, or, or rather they cannot vote against their own proposal, uh, but they usually want to vote for their proposal because they want to remain prime minister. Okay, that brings us to the end of the parliamentary, parliament meets phase. We then do refresh. Uh, the way refresh works is basically uh, officers and regiments move to the top of boxes, uh, extra ships go away, any riders who are out go back to their presidencies, any filled orders are taken off the board, and then we are ready to go for the next round. We advance the round marker. Our little status marker moves now to the London season, which is the last phase that needs explaining. London season phase has a few parts. Oh, um, this is a little funny. The refresh phase, you also have to pay upkeep on your houses. This is just on the board incorrectly right now. But basically, uh, during the end of your turn, you need to spend money. Uh, so three pounds here to, to keep this person in, a, in their plush lifestyle. Um, so, and I, so I know that the board is slightly mistaken here, but it, we're going to be fixing that soon. Um, okay, so London season has three aspects. It has attrition, prestige cards, and retirement. Oh, that, those, these are not in the correct order. Again, apologies for that. Uh, it's attrition, retirement, and then prestige cards. Uh, attrition works like this. You roll a die uh, for every one of your offices. So we roll a die for every one of the offices. Perfect. On a one or two, nothing happens. He's healthy as can be. On a three or four, they get a little tired. They get a little sick. They're fatigued. And what this means is every future fatigue attrition roll they're going to have, they're going to add plus one to that roll. Now the chairman always is fatigued, so they're always adding one to their roll. Uh, and in this case, the modified roll would be a seven, and on a five or six or higher, uh, the office is vacated. When that happens, you add it to the vacant office's stack, and the actual piece goes into your pensioner's box. Now, this happens all at the same time. We roll for everyone's, um, everyone's uh, attrition at the same time, and then beginning with the chairman or former chairman, as the case may be, players are going to spend money to retire. They can retire once for each one of their pensioners, and what they will do is they will assign their pensioner to one of these estates by paying the listed money. This is a great time to negotiate with your fellow players because only a few players are going to be running retirements, and uh, there are other players who might be retiring who are desperate for money, and you can take advantage of their desperation. Um, then, after everyone has retired in turn order, starting with the player who spent the most money, so usually all the money you spend you'll track with dice and TTS or with a pile of cash. Um, the player who spent the most money uh, gets to decide which of these three cards they want to take from the London season. If there's a tie, it's resolved in the order of the player who has the most windows and then in Prime Minister order, which is kind of like the universal tiebreaker for the game. So it's, it's most windows and then Prime Minister. Uh, and the, the person sitting closest to the Prime Minister or the Prime Minister. Now, when you uh, take a card from the, the London season display, um, you are welcome to peek at any blackmail, and then you can pick any of the three. So let's say this turn we had, um, I don't know, blue retired here. We'll make it nice and simple. So blue spent a total of four, uh, eight, uh, green spent four, yellow spent 14. So yellow gets to pick first, and they peek at this card, and but they decide they want the Rotten Borough. Then blue gets to go. They peek at this card and decide they want it, um, and then green goes last, and they decide to take the spouse. 
Now, if uh, let's say purple was also in the mix and they retired out here or something or here, uh, they may not get a chance to pick if they were last in order. Now, critically, this blackmail was seen by both yellow and blue. Blue ended up taking it. Green has no idea what it is. So the, uh, the blackmail cards create a kind of lovely asymmetry of information that creates all sorts of juicy gossip in the game. Um, okay, at the end of the London season, this display is cleared. And we draw three new cards, which will form the London display for the next se uh, season. Now, this deck includes bl uh, blackmail cards, so it's possible that all three cards could be blackmails, or maybe only one is, or two is, or anything like that. Um, okay, great. Uh, you now know how to play John Company, basically. Uh, there are some things I have not talked about, which I'm going to go into right now. Um, but, uh, you know, just kind of going back to that very first question that I got, someone asked about the running teach. Um, one way to teach this game is uh, you, the person who bought it, learn the rules, um, get comfortable with the game, and then you can almost run the game like a role-playing game. Because like a lot of role-playing games, the individual actions are very, very, very simple. And they're very thematically grounded. So one of the ways I used to teach this game is I'd say, like, I'm going to talk to you about the history for 10 minutes, and then let's go. And I'm just going to kind of help you take your first couple turns, and I'm going to run this like like, like we're playing uh, you know, a, a role-play session. And then halfway through the game, you, you can say, like, are you having fun? Do you feel comfortable with me taking the training wheels off? Do you like this game enough that you want to restart it or play it another day where you, where you can start fresh now that you know how the game works? And you can kind of, like, gauge the room. Because I just think there's a lot of different ways that, that a player can, 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 can learn. John Company. Uh, but the actual individual actions, as hopefully you're seeing, are fairly simple. Uh, they just demand a lot of consideration. A good example of that is something like the Prime Minister. Okay, so that's section two of this video, and we're now going to proceed right on to section three. Take a drink from my, my train mug, and we're going to move right along. Okay, so in this section, I want to talk about uh, how governors work, or how the game is set up, how governors work, and how the events work. And this is basically going to fill in a lot of the cracks uh, from the other teach. And this is stuff that really only one person at the table needs to know at start. Uh, but because you're all here, we're just going to keep on moving through it. So first of all, let's talk about how setup works in the game. So uh, you will pick a scenario, and there's going to be a scenario card. I actually just designed the scenario cards, and I can show you them. Maybe. Uh, it's, I don't know, it might be too tricky to show you that. But um, the game has scenario cards which will show the setup of India at the start of the game and will take you through a setup procedure. Uh, setup for this game is actually pretty fast. It, um, I would say like slightly longer than Oath, but um, you know maybe about the same as Root or something. Uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to take a, a deck of setup cards. Now there are 18 setup cards for each scenario. Uh, 12 of them are regular setup cards and then extra set there are six extra setup cards. The extra setup cards are used in games with five and six players. Now uh, in the rules it'll tell you to take a certain set of setup cards, a certain number, you know, they'll say like all the regulars and then, you know, take, uh, if you're basically you're, you're trying to get to numbers that evenly divide. So with the extra cards, if you want to play with six players, you're using basically all of them. You might only be using three of them if you're playing with five players, things like that. But what you're going to do is shuffle these setup cards, and you're going to deal them out. Um, let me bring up my UI here. Uh, you're going to deal them out equal to the number of players. So let's say we have a four-player game, so everybody is getting three setup cards. And... Um, you, each player will take their three setup cards and reveal them, and then basically they just take whatever these cards tell them to take. So uh, in, in this case, the enterprises correspond to the three basic enterprises over here, shipyards, luxuries, and workshops. So if you see an anchor that is unfitted, it means you take a shipyard and it's unfitted, which means the ship's on it. If it says anchor and place ship in the East Indian Sea, you're taking shipyard and the ship, and then you're putting the ship in play in the East Indian Sea here. Um, if it has an office on it, you're taking the office card and putting a family member in that office. Uh, Prime Minister, you get the Prime Minister wheel. Blackmail card, you, you take a blackmail card. Uh, one of the last setup stages is mixing these decks together, the blackmail and the um, 
prestige card deck to form the London season deck. Uh, so there'll be like a separate set of blackmails during the, the setup phase. Now, if you are teaching this game, hot tip, you can cheat here. Uh, you can give players uh, a set of cards that is a lot more friendly, so I highly recommend that the player teaching the game serve as the Prime Minister and the Chairman, because those are the two jobs that require the most far-ranging knowledge of the game systems. Uh, so just, just, just stack the deck so that you have a uh, a friendly set for teaching. Um, all of the setup scenarios in this game um, are kind of unbalanced in ways that are provocative and interesting. Um, it, sometimes you get a setup that is very, very unfriendly, but that can be a very useful point, a leverage point. And um, it, if, if your interest is in fairness, one, um, this game may not be the right game for you, sorry. But the other thing is um, uh, we have a, a very simple advanced draft system that can allow people to draft their setup positions if they prefer to play that way. Uh, okay. Uh, also, I'll mention, you might look at this card and be like a little mystified that there are so many symbols on them. The later scenarios, by and large, have more complicated setup positions. The early scenario, like 1710, has usually only two or three things per setup card. So the game state is a little reduced and a little easier to understand. Um, okay. Now there are the other thing I'll mention is there are three scenarios in the game. Uh, there's the seven or there are four scenarios. There's the seventeen ten early company scenario. Uh, there's the seventeen fifty eight scenario which introduces the possibility that the company might have its uh, monopoly broken uh, by an aggressive parliament. And then there's the eighteen thirteen scenario where the monopoly is already broken. Uh, the 1813 scenario is best for five and six very experienced players. 1758 is uh, kind of good good for players who've played a few games, but also who want a very um, tense scenario. Uh, it's, I think it might be like the hardest scenario in the game. Uh, I think it's also my favorite. And then um, the 1710 is definitely the intro scenario, but there is so much meat on the bone here. Can't emphasize this enough. I know a lot of people who are big fans of John Company First Edition who only ever played the 1710 scenario. Um, and the, the, you know, the two you know two thirds of the game was unexplored, and they still had a good time. Now, uh, the other thing I'll mention here about the uh, seventeen ten scenario is there are two ways to play it. You can just play the regular seventeen ten scenario, or you can play the full campaign, which is an a long scenario. It's about twice it can be about twice as long as the other scenarios in the game, but that kind of includes every in the game. Uh, so you can you can take the company through the whole history in a long evening. Um, okay, so that's set up. Easy, done. Two more things to talk about. Governors and events. So let's talk about governors. Um, the way governors work is uh, regions get conquered by the company. They get associated with a presidency, which means the president can decide when its associated offices act. And again, remember, the associated offices are commanders, governors, and the president themselves. Now, when a commander, when a governor acts, uh, let's get a governor card here. Oh, there's one in this stack. There's one right here. Uh, so here's the governor of Bombay. The governor has access to an action called the administrate, the, the administer action. Uh, and the way this works, this action works very differently from any other action in the game. So the way this works is they have a dice pool, uh, which is set. Uh, it depends on the region. Some regions have dice pools of four, some only have three. Now, the way this works is every time they take an administer action, no matter what happens, their pool of dice goes down by one. So their first action is going to be a three dice action, their second action is going to be a two dice, and then if they want to take a third action, it's a one, it's a one dice action. Now, um, the way that this works is they take the action, and then if it is successful, they get a buck. They just get money for, for being successful, and then they choose one of three options. Uh, their options are they can generate some tax, some tax money for the company, they can recruit a regiment, or they can build a company ship. Now, I'm going to take those one at a time. If they generate money for the company, they can add it to their president's treasury. They can also add it to the company balance. Now, one very useful thing about adding money to the president's treasury is if the president hasn't acted yet, they could use that incoming tax revenue to help them trade. However, if they take the act, let, let, let's say they choose to tax and add to the presidency. If they want to take a tax again that turn, they will have to add an unrest cube, which is the same thing as a fatigue cube, but it sits on a region, and it's going to create problems for this region later on in the game. 
Okay, so let's say they were successful. The, com the family took their dollar. They decided to tax. They gave the money to the president. And they decided to go in and act again. Now, oh no, the poor governor of Bombay, they rolled, their low roll was a four, which is a failure. And so on a failure, uh, they do not make a, a pound, sorry for them, but they do add a, another unrest to the region. So uh, now their dice pool is only one dice, and they could, for instance, chance on rolling again. So let's imagine they decide to roll again. Hey, they got lucky. Uh, they get to take another pound, and they get to choose... An action. If they were to choose to tax, they would add a third fatigue, another fatigue to Bombay, uh, but they could give more money to the president. Let's talk about those other actions, though. They could place a regiment. This is very simple. The regiment just goes from the supply to the army. And again, you can see how a governor could raise a bunch of regiments, which then a commander could use to attack with right away. Uh, and then finally, they have the option to build a company ship. Now, this option, which you can see has two arrows in it, is a two-step action. The first time they take the action, they will take a company ship and put it in their region. And all this means is that the ship is not complete. It's half-built. If they take this action again, they move the ship out to the sea zone. So a governor needs to take this action twice. Um, to complete a ship, those actions don't have to be consecutive. I could build a ship halfway, I could choose to tax the region or raise a regiment, and then even on a future turn, a different governor could could complete this company ship. Uh, okay, that is how the governors work. Uh, they're uh, interesting office, a lot of different ways to use them, um, and I hope that was pretty clear. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about related to governors the governor general. Now this uh, office, you'll note, was not on the track. This office is spawned, uh, not spawned, it sounds crazy. This office is created by the passage of a law. And when it is created, all of the governors lose their jobs and become pensioners. So good for them. Uh, but this job takes over the director of trade. The director of trade becomes the governor general, and basically the governor general is a governor that acts with all regions. So it's a centralization of gov governor uh, of ad administration. And the way this works is your dice pool is two plus one for every company controlled region. And one problem with this is you'll note that the failure, instead of just dropping uh, a single unrest cube in the region where you failed, you put an unrest in every company region. Also, when you tax, you make a lot more money. You make two pounds per region, but you always drop unrest whenever you tax. So the governor general is just like a bigger and more dramatic version of a governor that can be brought in the game depending on the scenario or if players choose to pass pass a law. But it really changes the, the company structure. Okay. So the last thing that needs talked about is the event system. Now, the event system is described on the player aid. So it's described here on the event, events in India player aid. You'll note that there are several different events in the game. Windfalls, turmoils, shuffles, pieces, crisis, crises events, leader events, and foreign invasion events. Now, before you get too scared, let me just show you in the rules how, much, how many rules these, these take up. Uh, um, uh, one second. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the event rules. So the events in any phase is described here, uh, and we have, you know, general rules are put here in this spread. Um, and then the actual events are one page, two page, Three pages so it's three pages which is a lot but it's also just like not it's not it's not a huge amount of rules uh, when you actually lay it out let's talk about how they work so basically the event is going to occur in the region pictured unless it is an elephant event uh, like a crisis or a peace event in which case it will uh, be keyed to where the elephant is now we've already talked about crisis events the other things you need to know about crisis events actually I screwed up slightly in my rules explanation earlier because when there is a revolt crisis, like when a, when Ratha broke from Delhi, all the orders in the region get closed. So just small note on that. Um, so uh, 
if the so other things you need to know about the crisis event is that if the company is attacked so this region is now occupied by, by the company uh, that the company has to exhaust its armies for strength points to defend uh, and if it fails to do that you have to do the region loss procedure um, which involves the removing of the commander and uh, the company standing going down and things like that um, it, it's bad but you just follow the instructions on region loss uh, which is kind of in the middle center of the page. So you can see that the crisis event is handled by this table, which has invasions, rebellions, and attacks on the, uh, the, the company. They all work a little bit differently. Uh, one, one thing to remember about when the company is attacked is that you have to resolve an attack on every region that has unrest. So if, like, uh, if, if, if Madras here was owned by the company and Bombay was attacked, we would resolve the principal event first, which is the Marathans attacking the company's bases in Bombay. And then we would also resolve an additional attack in Madras. And those uh, attacks are modified by the number of unrest in the region. So they increase, <clears throat> they increase the amount of unrest, uh, the, the strength of the crisis. OK, so that's the end of the crisis rules. Let's go through the deck uh, and talk about the other ones. So the windfall event is very straightforward. Uh, every rider in Bombay or adjacent to Bombay makes a buck. Remember, this does not have an elephant on it, so it's just keyed off the top of the deck. Uh, crisis events, we've already talked about. There's another one. Uh, turmoil. This turmoil occurs in Bengal. The way this works is, uh, oops, that's a joke, a joke tile. Um, you place in the northwestern and the northmost open order, sorry, um, this is badly worded, and I'll fix the wording, but it's close the northernmost open order. So this order in Bengal is the northernmost order. It's closed. And that's it. Uh, that's all the turmoil does. Now, if every order was already full and we have to turmoil in Bengal, that causes a cascade. And the way a cascade works is you generate an additional piece not an additional piece. You generate uh, an additional closed order in every adjacent connecting order. So in this case, Maratha would be hit here and here. They can't handle either one of them. So they also cascade, which means they're going to close here and here and here. Now, in this case, this order is already closed, so it's just going to go to the northernmost order. And in this case, this order, the connecting order is already closed, so it's going to go to the northernmost order. And in this case, it's already closed, so it's going to cascade. There's no other order it can go to, which means it will close this order and this order. So if many regions of India are closed, these things are going to move around. Now, every region can only cause one cascade. So even though this was closed and this was closed, Maratha can only cause one cascade, so it doesn't like do that again. Um, but you can see how, depending on how India is set up, especially if Maratha is in chaos, if Maratha is hostile to company trade and the company isn't paying attention, it can easily cause the whole region to kind of like ossify and harden against the company. Uh, and that's the cascade rule, uh, which, which is, is, is used even beyond turmoil. So like if a region, for instance, uh, let's say Bengal would re successfully revolt against Maratha and get its independence from the Maratha Confederacy, one of the things that would happen is all, all orders in Bengal would close. And because they're already closed, it triggers the cascade rule. <clears throat> the cascade rule is described um, in the top right of this event. Of this event. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the leader event, uh, this event occurs in the Punjab, and there are two different things that can happen. If <clears throat> the region is sovereign, and a sovereign region is a region that has no flag or a flag with a star, if a region sovereign, so if Punjab was sovereign, it would raise in size. Now, unfortunately, Punjab is it's dominated by Delhi, and so instead, it's going to revolt. And so in this case, it revolts with a strength of two. Uh, that's higher than Delhi's. So congratulations to the Punjab. It is now uh, not dominated. It was successful. And... <clears throat> Uh, we take a look at Delhi and realize that even though it has a capital flag, it no longer um, has any dependent states, so it loses its flag. It, uh, the empire has has atrophied down to just a single state. 
Now, there are, uh, there, there's one interesting little point here about rebellions and invasions and how they impact strength. And basically what you need to know is that if an invasion fails, the capital is embarrassed and they lose one step of their strength. And if a revolt fails, the capital is embarrassed that there was a revolt to begin with and they lose a strength. So uh, that, that loss, those losses, by the way, are described in the crisis chart where you can see what happens under victory and defeat. Like everything in this game, uh, the rules are fundamentally pretty procedural, so you can just take them kind of one sentence at a time when you're working through this for the first time. And once you get a, hand, a handle, they tend to be pretty naturalistic. Okay, the shuffle event uh, moves the elephant. In this case, the elephant is going to move to the pictured region, so this is Hyderabad. They move to the pictured region, and um, Hyderabad is a sovereign state, so it will not revolt, but instead point uh, on the circle boundary, which is here uh, into Madras. Now, one thing here, the elephant, like, who cares if it covers up a path? That Don't worry about that. It's just, it's sitting on the border. Uh, okay, and then after that, you shuffle this card in with the deck. Shuffle, shuffle. And then you would shuffle all of the cards on the left and stack them on top. I'm not going to bother to do that for this example because uh, I want to get through the last event which is, I think, the peace event is the last one. Oh, no, we have two more. Uh, the peace event, uh, the way it works is um, you look at where the elephant's at. This is an elephant uh, event. And if there are any sovereign regions in of the adjacent regions, so Hyderabad and Madras, they're going to get taller. They're going to get stronger because of the peace. And then any connecting orders, these two, are opened. And you can see that on this tile. If the event was fully within a company region, uh, all orders in that region would be opened. But that's only if it's fully in. And that is listed on the... Uh, the last event is the foreign evasion event. <clears throat> the foreign evasion event is uh, a, a conglomerate event. Basically, it's just a bunch of invasions, a bunch of crises. You roll this dice, and uh, you resolve an invasion in the eastern sea zone. So that would be in Bengal. The invasion has a strength equal to whatever the result of a die is, so a strength of four. So there's going to be a, a strength of four event here. Uh, in this case, it's fighting an empire. Now, I haven't talked about this, but when an, an empires uh, are invaded um, or invade, they add their strength. So in this case, uh, you look at the two for the capital, the one for Bengal, that's a total of three. Pretty strong, not stronger than a four. So in this case, um, you know, this, this might be the French uh, this, you know, if it's, it's happening over on this side of the board, it could be the Persians. Uh, and then what you do is this region becomes um, sovereign and has a strength equal to the result of the die. Now, in the TTS mod right now, these towers only go up to a strength of, of four uh, or a five, but, but, you, but you, could, you could raise them infinitely um, if you wanted to. Uh, okay, that's how, how the four invasion uh, works. There's two uh, small notes to it, though. Uh, one of them is, if you are sad enough to roll this face, you resolve a foreign invasion in every single sea zone uh, region. So Bombay, Madras, and Bengal all get invaded. If you roll um, the, 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 the side that does not show a face, you use whatever the top card is. Woo! Okay, that's the event phase. Um, now, there are a couple things I haven't talked about. Uh, the, the main one is uh, the different promises and how they work. Uh, the, all, I'm not going to talk about them in detail, but all I'll say is that um, there are various wrinkles to the timing of all these promises, and they are described on the back of each promise card. So if you have questions about what, how the, a promise works, you can find that information right, right there. Um, okay, I'm going to take a breath and look at the board and see if there's anything I'm forgetting. Uh, okay, I haven't talked about region loss. I haven't talked about um, trophies very much. We can touch on those. Um, basically, region loss, it, it's hardly worth teaching because the first time uh, you do it, you'll just have to run through the procedure. Basically, um, the commander gets demoted and they have to lose half of their trophies and a region is lost. That's the tarnish the commander's name. Then you do an officer route. You do a death check on all the officers. Then the governor gets eliminated. You put the governor back in the box. It can be recreated later. Critically, this token, this good loot token, just sits on the side of the board. 
So it will not the region will no longer be worth bonus loot, just the, the base loot. Uh, and then if it's conquered again, you will again turn it to play down here. Um, and then uh, the last thing that happens is that we, we restore um, we restore local authority, which means that you, you put a dome back in the region with a strength of one. And uh, you uh, tarnish, you embarrass the company and lower the, the standing. Uh, and then let me actually check a very quick rule here. Um, yeah, cool. So if you were to somehow, let me make sure that, that this is even possible. You lose one. So it, let's say we're, we're losing regions. There's a foreign invasion. First one is going to lower by one spot. Second one's going to lower by two. Third one is going to lower by three. The fourth one, it's not even listed here because it, it, I don't think it's ever happened in, um, in testing where the company has survived, but it would, of course, lower it at four, but it doesn't matter because it, it's just going to it's gonna cause the company to fail. Um, but I guess we could put a little three plus or something to indicate that. Um, that's the kind of like hypothetical someone's going to ask me about, and I'm like, did that happen in your game? Probably not. Um, okay, so that is that. Uh, end of game. Uh, when the game ends, you go through in-game scoring uh, described on this chart. Uh, you're going to score the power award based on everyone's holdings and their power. Uh, blackmail cards are worth power if you played them. If you play a blackmail card, you get to keep it in your little stash. Uh, Face-up blackmail cards cannot be traded. Um, and whether or not you played it or not, it's worth the power in the bottom left. You also get power from enterprises, trophies, past laws. If you hold the prime minister, you get two power. Uh, and then you'll get your victory points award for that. Then we score uh, shares and workshops. Uh, if the company was successful, uh, shares are worth one. If the company was unsuccessful, they're worth minus one. And if the company was unsuccessful, uh, workshops. So if fail, if the company failed, workshops are worth one. Uh, and, and that's because, by the way, um, if textiles aren't being imported from India, well, then the local manufacturers are going to benefit quite a bit. Uh, then finally, we check for the final scoring adjustment. If the company was successful, we roll for a final re retirement. We do not bother to fill the London season display or anything like that. Um, or you don't bother to, to take the London any card from the London season. That's the final retirement. Or if the company fails, uh, the public gets very mad and decides to blame someone. And we shuffle this consequence of company failure deck and flip one of these. Military rebuked. Lower each score player score by half of the sum of their officers, commanders, and trophies. Round down. Uh, so you know you you would add up all your officers and things and and get hurt a little bit. Now, why these cards exist is because um, a player who has a small lead can't safely torpedo the company because they might lose the game on 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 the draw of these cards, which can be quite damaging. So some something to think about. Um, okay. So that is the complete set of rules for John Company. My gosh, we've been talking for two hours. We're going a little long. Um, the only thing I haven't described, which I want to describe in the fourth section of this video, is uh, the private firms. Now, I'm be going a little fast through this, both because um, I need to help my wife with bedtime, uh, and also because the private firm rules are fairly straightforward, and um, I, I think we can go through them uh, somewhat quickly. So, um, the first thing to note is how uh, deregulation happens. So, uh, deregulation is a special law which is in effect if you're playing the 1813 scenario and can come into effect in the long campaign game or in the 1758 game. Now, uh, if it comes into effect, the way this works is if the company's standing or debt is on a striped spot, uh, at the start of the turn, for the London season, the Prime Minister can vote for deregulation, can, can put this out, can call a special session of Parliament and can vote on company deregulation. If the standing or debt is on a star space, they must vote for deregulation. The support that the law has initially depends on how dire the company's straits are. It has a plus two support if it's in one striped spot. It has a plus six support if it's in uh, a double, if both of these markers are in striped spaces. Um, this is a special law when it's voted on, uh, no policy is associated with it, and if it fails, 
um, uh, the, the prime minister doesn't lose to the opposition or anything like that. So when this is passed, it gives the players, uh, basically unlocks the firm phase. Let's talk about the firm phase. Um, the way the firm phase works, uh, so if it passes, um, the amount of debt the company has is cut in half, and the standing uh, goes back to the starting spot right here, or the spot that's under the 10 expectations uh, spot. So the, the company basically gets like whew, breath of fresh air after deregulation comes. Uh, second, second lease on life. And in fact, the biggest trick of the 1758 scenario is understanding that you get like one phone a friend, you get one lifeline, and deciding when to use deregulation. Even if you don't want to start a firm and you're pro-company, you oftentimes need to use deregulation to just give the company um, a, a little bit of a helping hand. Okay, so all deregulation does to the game is it says, hey, the firm phase, it now happens, and the presidency phases are going to be a little different. So here's how the firm phase happens. Uh, during the firm phase, uh, players can start firms. How do you start a firm? Well, you start a firm by spending an investment. There are two ways to get investments. If neither of the company's tokens is in a striped section, uh, you can sacrifice one of your shares as an investment. Uh, if they are in these striped sections, the company's shares are weak uh, and you cannot. Uh, one second. Uh, you, you cannot sacrifice your shares. The other ways to do it is with your workshops. You can take a workshop and flip it to its invested side. You'll note that an invested workshop loses its profitability and its victory point hedge when it's invested. But when you do that, you uh, can have your investment create a firm. Every firm is like a little mini company that you uh, are the manager of. And you put, when you start a firm, you put five pounds in its London treasury and five pounds in its India tre or not, what am I saying? Just five pounds in its London treasury. Boop. And on TTS, I use dice to track this because I hate having a dozen of these counters around. Um, okay, so let's talk about how firms work. Uh, when you start a firm, you put your one of your cubes on the value track, which shows how much the firm is worth. And you have somebody in the London Treasury. Now, when the, the, the way the firm phase works, this is a real-time phase. You can Anybody can take actions in it. And what you're going to be doing is uh, players are, can um, basically, or firms can fit ships. So players can start firms. And firms can fit ships, receive investments, and merge with each other. The way fitting ships works is very simple. Um, if there is a ship, so for example, let's say uh, Yellow here owns the Atlas. This firm can spend three pounds from its London treasury, just like the company, to fit a ship, which they then put there. Critically, they need the permission of the player who owned the ship. And that player might say, like, oh, I don't really want to do this, but if you give me a dollar, uh, the manager of the firm is not allowed to give money out of the London treasury. They can give money out of their personal treasury, of course. But maybe, um, you know, they, they can make all sorts of deals about what, um, you know, about how, 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 to structure, how to structure this this fitting of a ship. Uh, players can also fit ships that belong to the company as long as they are player ships that are under lease. In this case, instead of paying the bank, so when you fit a ship, you always pay the bank, except if a private firm fits a player ship that's been leased to the company. Boy, that was a full sentence. Let me start over. If a private firm wants to fit, let's say, the Britannia, Oh, the Sykes, they, they've owned the Britannia for generations. They really want to fit it, but it's been leased to the company. Uh, they are allowed to buy the company out of its lease. They have to give the company three pounds if the ship is in a good spot. If it's fatigued, they only have to give the company two pounds. So they can give the company two pounds like that. That comes from the London Treasury. That money is then given to the shipping office, which can direct it to other ships in the future. Okay, now... This poor firm has no money in it. They might or might want to receive additional investments so that they could ask, hey, yeah, you know, let's say they invested this workshop to get things started. They could say, hey, Yellow, uh, would you want to invest your workshop? If they say yes, Yellow invests their workshop and adds a share to the company. Every investment adds one share to the company. Uh, there is a max uh, number of shares of 10. Uh, I think there is no max to ships, but it might be getting a max at some point. It is a, that's an open dev question. There's been maxes in the past, uh, but it's not, 
I think I think I think currently there, there's no max, and it's probably not going to change. Okay, every investment that is added to the company brings in five pounds to the London Treasury. Now, at the end of the firm phase, we set our strategy and bid. So the way this works is firms have uh, four strategies. They can trade in the west, south, or east, or they can hobnob, which is listed as no sale in the mod right now. That will be changed soon when I actually do the, put this through a layout pass. Um, the way these firm strategies work is this is where the company is planning on trading, or, or the firm is planning on trading. So let's say for sake of example, they want to trade in the South Indian. Whoops. The way this works is they will select an amount of money Let's say they select four pounds, so they will reduce this to one, and they will put four pounds on their on their bid, and they just kind of hold this here. This bid is face down technically, so no one knows where what what they're planning on doing with their money. Okay, that is the firm phase. Now, when the president gets to operate, right before they start taking actions after deregulation, a president will say, "Hello, are there any firms that are planning on trading?" Uh, in this C zone, and so th th this firm says, nope, we are not. This occurs normally, and then we go to the president of Madras. They ask the same thing, and this firm says, ah, but I am trading in the southern C zone. Now, trades work a little differently once private firms are in the game. Private firm will roll dice equal to the number of their bid, so they'll roll four dice. And like presidents, they only get one, uh, uh, sorry, unlike presidents, they can only take one trade roll. Uh, if they fail this roll, they can't get money from other places. If it is successful, the firm will figure out its initiative. The initiative is the number of ships minus the number of successes. So in this case, this firm has two ships and it rolled two successes. So its initiative is zero and you want a low, low, low initiative. Uh, let's say then that the company goes and the company uh, later on has a bunch of ships so they've got four and they're gonna make a roll of let's say uh, three dice okay they roll their three dice this is the company and they were successful whoops I knocked that dice they were successful as well the initiative of the company is four minus one success so for an initiative of three. So in, at, at this point, no orders have been filled. So basically, to, to, just to tr tread back a little bit, at the start of the president's phase, they are going to have the firm's roll. Then they conduct all their operations, and once they have rolled for trade, whenever that is during their operations, they stop and they say, okay, we've now checked everyone's trade rolls. And, and th this is only done once the president either has decided they're not going to trade, or they can't trade, or they have one. They have their first success. Now we go in initiative order. The firm goes first. Firms can trade with the capacity of the number of ships plus one. So this firm is trading with three ships essentially, and they are going to mark their filled orders with these pieces. And so that they go, aha, we get. I have three trade capacity. Uh, they need at least one ship to trade though, uh, and so they're going to go five pounds going to go an additional four pounds, so nine total, and an additional seven pounds uh, for 16 total. And where does that 16 go? Well, they're going to take that money and put it in their India treasury. So we have 6, 12, plus 4, is 16. Again, this is a lot easier with coins. Now, for every 6 added, they adjust their value 1. This value is going to determine the value of their of their firm shares at the end of the game. Every share is worth the amount of victory points listed. Okay. So everyone does their trading. Now, the thing about uh, after the uh, deregulation is passed, multiple firms in the company can fill orders that have already been filled, but they take the lower number, which is the half rounded down number. So if the company with its four uh, ships trades, they would go and take two, four, you know, seven, and then that's it. So there's only seven pounds earned. So they made, you know, le you know, basically less than half or, a, uh, or they, they made, you know, half or so uh, of what the company made. Um, okay. Or sorry, the, the, the firm made all, double what, what, what the company made. 
All right, so now the other phase that is modified is the revenue phase. And the revenue phase is resolved um, with, with the firms going first. I think in prime minister order is how they go. It usually doesn't matter. Uh, th this can be done um, in, in, in mostly in real time. Uh, the reason it matters is for mergers, which we'll talk about later. So the way this works is the firm has to pay expenses. They exp pay expenses for... Uh, $1 for each of their ships, so in this case $2, and then they either pay the value or the number of shares, whichever one is higher. So in this case, the firm's expenses are 3 plus 2 is 5, so that is taken out of their money. It can be taken out of the India Treasury or it can be taken out of the London Treasury. It doesn't matter. Uh, so in this case, they would probably choose to take uh, 1 out of the London Treasury and then the, the remaining 4 would be taken out of the India Treasury. At this point, uh, the firm is welcome to pay dividends. Every dividend, um, uh, every, every dividend, uh, great question that I'll get to in a second. Uh, every dividend is paid out like the company uh, where every piece, every share is going to pay one. And then the manager, the person who owns the uh, firm, gets an additional pound for each dividend. So in this case, uh, purple. And I know this, the colors don't match, but don't worry about that too much. Uh, purple, if they were the manager, would get one for being manager, one for their share. Yellow gets one. So they could choose to pay out, for instance, um, three dividends. So that would cost nine total. Uh, and so they, they can pay that here by saying six and then paying three out of that. Um, and then those every uh, that, that would give yellow three pounds, which made, meant their investment was a very good investment. And purple would get six pounds. Okay, any money that is left in the India Treasury is going to drop down to the London Treasury. The last thing that happens is the second firm cube is going to go on this track to mark the total number of dividends paid. Uh, and the reason this is done is because when we get to the London season, any player who has a share in a firm may take a free pensioner, even if they haven't retired anyone and they can spend money up to the amount of dividends paid to retire them so they can say hey you know my i i was a shareholder in a firm that paid out nine total i can spend you know eight of my own pounds to retire someone here and this means that you get access to pensioners even if you're not in the company uh and so it makes the london season a little bit uh viable um so uh, someone asked, the bid tokens for firms, are they meant to be face down and then flip to reveal choice? The flip, uh, TS, TTS flips everything along the same axis. Uh, yeah, so uh, in TTS, it's a little obvious. And so you can use hidden zones if you want or just you know use the honor system. Uh, in the physical game, the back of this is going to have a seamless back so that you won't know which side is up based on the back of the piece, um, like the way this one is built. Um, okay, so yes, it is accounted for. Uh, all right, does another player need permission to invest in your firm? Yes, you cannot just take investors. Now, let's say a firm couldn't meet its expenses. It's a bad place for a firm to be. If they can't meet expenses, their firm is dissolved and all shares that were on that firm go to the poorhouse and on the back of the deregulation card will be a debtor's prison where they're going to be worth minus one victory point at the end of the game. Uh, so that that's bad news. Um, all ships that were owned by the firm go back to the different uh, shipyards um, and the firm's value is set to zero. This board is flipped back to its family side. It's bad. So if you can't pay expenses, you are allowed to receive emergency investments. Now emergency investments are a little bit different uh, from other investments. Um, so every time uh, the, the way they work is you still need to give permission. They're still going to create shares. However, each inv emergency investment is going to lower the value of the firm by one, and it will um, generate uh, it will generate five pounds that are paid towards the investment or uh, towards the outstanding expenses that haven't been paid. However, any outstanding money from those emergency investments is lost, just like emergency debt to the company. So if you were just one over, if you were at minus one, you had one expense you couldn't pay, and you took an emergency 
uh, investment, you're getting hit on value, and that four pounds that, that you would have gotten from a normal investment is lost because it was an emergency investment. Uh, this is a great way for players to take control of your firms. So what will happen sometimes is some players will run like insurance companies where they hold a bunch of workshops that they don't invest because what they're thinking is, I'm going to, like Yellow could hold two workshops and then say, hey, if this firm, if it, if it gets in a bad way and you need me, I'm going to be dropping in two shares and taking over th this firm and doing hostile takeovers. So the hostile takeover rules, I'll just briefly gesture to. If ever you own uh, the majority of shares and you aren't the manager, you can just outright steal this firm. And the way that works is you take everything onto your own firm board, and this firm vo board uh, reverts to its family size. So all these pieces would move. Uh, so that's how hostile takers, takeovers at work. Uh, the last set of firm rules that I have to touch on are um, the uh, um, well, I think that there are two more weird rules. One of them needs signposted a little bit. Um, but I'll figure it out. So um, the, the last thing that uh, I need to talk about is mergers. Basically, two firms can merge. Uh, there are some specific rules that, that talk about how things are combined. Basically, you can't generate more shares than the amount of the combined values of, of the company. You can't have ghost shares, but you can restructure ownership a little bit when you do the merger, and all the ships glom together and things like that. Um, mergers are very common when you have two firms that are struggling, and they're competing against a very strong firm or a, a very strong company. Uh, lastly, uh, if the company fails, firms are granted a final a final retirement using uh, their special pensioner that they're getting from any dividends the firm might have gained on the last term. Woo! Okay, I told you we were going to go fast. Uh, that's all the firm rules, I think, basically. Um, they're wild. Uh, they really uh, fundamentally change the game, and it feels a lot more like you're playing, in the words of one first edition playtester, uh, 18xx, the role-playing game. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of that. Uh, and that brings us to the end of our super combined teach. Um, you know, I hope, uh, for those of you watching your watches, uh, what, what I hope this illustrated was, you know, a general thematic introduction to this game can take about 10 minutes, uh, uh, a fulsome explanation of all the offices of the game. Uh, takes about 30 or 40 minutes, and but it doesn't actually take that much longer if you're just playing out a first turn. And I usually recommend that you um, hold everyone's hand and use the first turn as a as a demo of the game, uh, and then is you know you can almost usually you can just start playing after that, and players can be. Can be to go. So I usually tell people that if you're teaching a game of John Company, that first game is going to be about an hour longer than it normally sometimes an hour and a half longer uh, but once uh, players get over that hump uh, it, it plays very very smoothly um, okay but that's it I think this is the very first time in my life that I have taught every rule in John Company in one sitting and I do not plan on doing it anytime again soon um, so are there any questions I grant you 10 minutes of questions um, is there any significance to the colors of hireable allies? Ah, what, what a great question. Um, there used to be, uh, and it, these colors are all messed up right now, but um, basically uh, the Nizam is the, the ruler of Hyderabad, and so these, these tiles used to sit on the board, even though they had affiliation in the armies. And so playtesters whined about this, and they were right, that they were like, no, this piece should sit here because it doesn't matter that it's on the map. So the, the, the colors are a relic of that. I might find a way to like, you know, do it a little bit more subtly. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just a relic of when they used to sit on the board. Great question. Um, the, I, I will say a, a, a car on that, um, uh, the Ganjifa art style art was done by an Indian artist named Amita Pai, who did a wonderful job. These are traditional uh, paintings. And um, we use them also, a reduced version of them is present uh, on the, the board itself. And both the icons and the colors of the regions were all picked for different historical significances, which I could, which I could look up. And I'm hoping that we can feature in the rule. Yeah, I love that. The, the different art styles are great and they work really well together.
Thank you. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really happy with it. it, it I was a little worried because it, 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 it breaks certain rules <laughs> of graphics. Like there are two people on horses, which if I showed that to our UI editor at Leader Games, he'd be like, he'd slap my wrist and be like, what are you doing? Putting two horse regions next to each other. And so we, we tried to counterbalance that by making sure they had very contrasting colors, uh, even though they are, you know, they are quite different. Um, okay, we have a few folks typing questions and I will hear them out. Um, are unrest cubes only removed by an event? Great question. So uh, after they, basically after they have a, their time in the sun and attack, they do get removed. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that I mentioned that commanders only have one action. They have the, the deploy action. Uh, the deploy action will conquer a region if it hasn't been conquered yet. It will become company controlled. If the region is already company controlled, uh, you can still take the deploy action in it. And when you do that, you force forcibly open all orders in the region and you remove all unrest in the region. So yeah, I, I get just completely space mentioning that, but the deploy action is used to make new regions be company controlled and then also to clean up regions that are already company controlled. Um, how much longer would it take to explain the solo rules? How dare you? <laughs> no, um, so the solo rules in the rule book are quite brief. And let me, I'll, I'll just show you them. Uh, this will not take very long at all. So at the very end of the rules, you get to this playing with one or two section. And uh, you have basically this spread, and then you have these spreads, and then there's this last page, which is not very much. They take five pages or so. Uh, and then everything you need to play with the solo, the solo is fully operational right now. It works really good. It's in final development. Everything you need to play with the solo is right here. Um, and basically, uh, there are promise, the crown is promises. Uh, it basically, it adds a player that, that, that you play with. And then their actions are determined by the flip of a card, which, uh, like the old Wakan bot, these cards interact together. And then uh, the way it works is uh, the, the solo player always has a mood. It can be bullish or mousy or foxy or uh, peacocky, peacocking. And then what you do is you have this thing called the crown handbook. And the way the crown handbook handbook works is it takes you through a turn and on your turn um you just do what it says so like during the family action the crown is going to take different family actions depending on its mood and in this you'll see a little menu of uh of things that they can buy and sell and what you're looking at here is the players will have promises they'll have like things that the crown um like you know so you have uh, well, they're promise cubes in the first edition sense. And so the way this works is, let's say blue has three promises from the crown. Well, in the London season, they could spend two of those promises to take a buck from the crown. So this is actually like a bot that will negotiate with you a little bit. And depending on its mood, it will have different things that you can use to earn promises. So for example, when you're hiring, if you hire a crown member, you get to take a promise from them. And then later in the game, you might say like, oh, well, I'm seeking debt and I'm the chairman. And if the crown's a bull, I can get them to approve my debt for an additional for an additional promise or something. So this booklet just kind of takes you through the order of the turn and shows you both what the crown's doing and also all of its priorities, as well as um, different things you can buy and sell from the crown. And it also shows like, um, for instance, like how it will vote on all the different laws. One thing that informed this solo design was that the, the, the solo design for Premiere and for Oath both struggled with the fact that we gave them very limited real estate. And for this one, I basically told Ricky, uh, the, the solo version of Premiere is so good. You have a carte blanche. If you want a whole other handbook that's 12 pages that you know is illustrated as charts and stuff, um, you, you, you get it. Uh, and so we, we, we tried to make the, the solo mode as friendly as possible. And so it's our hope that like Premiere, you know, I always tell pe people, people ask me how, how well does Premiere scale? And what I always tell people is Premiere scales exceptionally well, but it is completely different at every single player count. And that is true of John company. Uh, the, the solo game is very, very tricky. If you like Wakan, you will love it. Uh, the two-player game has a lot of like cooperative moments, um, but is also very uh, interesting and feels a lot like the three-player game. The three-player game is very brittle, and it's a, it's a very combo-heavy game in the same way that the Premier one can be. The, the four- and five-player game are, are a lot bigger, and the, the five- and six-player game have a, um, a real, like... 
players players control smaller and smaller sections of the company uh, in the higher player count games. So the negotiations tend to be very desperate in the higher player counts, which can be a lot of fun. Uh, one thing I like about John Company a lot is that um, the playtime doesn't actually change that much. It's a little bit faster with with you know three players or four players than with six, but it's not that much faster. So I usually tell people, you know, John Company is like two hours plus. 10 minutes per player or 15 minutes per player or something like that. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, that that's the solo game. So now I can really say that I, I touched all the bases. Um, you know, in terms of the components, a lot of what you're looking at here is very close to final. We're, we're going through, and I, I even made a little list during this demo of tiny things that I need to adjust and check on. Um, we are just now, so we've just now submitted the game for editorial review. And so the next two months, we're going to be just going through it. If you want to play right now, you can, maybe not at this moment, uh, go over to the Whirly Gig Discord. There are like literally games of this going on almost every day. Uh, and it's very easy to find a game in either European time zones or in American time zones. I'd say people on the West Coast, we have fewer West Coast players. Uh, but, you know, if a few of you join, it'll probably create a core. Uh, okay, that's it. Well, my, uh, I just got a big plate of dinner handed to me, so I'm going to stop talking and go uh, help with bedtime and things like that. Thank you all for coming to this. Uh, it was a delight to take you through the game. Um, this has been like a real labor of love. Uh, we, Drew and I have been working on this game for years and years and years, and it's so um, we're so happy that it's finally done. And uh, Historicon had played a huge part in the finishing of the game, so it feels only right to like have the real inaugural teach of the near final game happen here. Uh, if you have questions, you're welcome to drop them in the chat, and I can respond in text uh, sometime in the next few hours. Also, uh, the Whirligig uh, Discord, when you join it, there are several chats for the development of John Company, and there is a rules questions chat that is very, very active, and uh, you can probably find answers to anything that you need. All right, that's it. Uh, thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful night.